Can you guys hear me now? Perfect. Sorry for all the troubles. Um, still having some difficulties here. I think my resolution is not sized correctly. So I'm going to need to play around with that a little bit. All right, guys, how's that? Can you guys see it? Can you hear me? Can you guys see it? Okay, perfect. So uh, we're just going to get started then. Again, sorry for uh, all the delays and stuff with everything going on uh first time on twitch for me uh, again this is timehawk from x trades uh here with a short and base on options today uh so what i'm planning on do is that every two weeks i'll be doing a essentially a um a course on options uh sharing what i know about options and how i use them uh when to use them etc and uh, at the end of every session, we'll have opportunities to basically do a QA. and a uh, You can ask me things. Uh, but, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, send messages or whatever on, in the chat if you have any questions about what we're currently talking about, and I'll try to go through them uh, as, as we move along. Um, again, first time on Twitch uh, streaming in general, so just bear with me. I'll do the best I can, and let's hope that today is going to be pretty fun. Oh, thanks. Didn't realize the date was wrong. Uh, I'll fix that for later. Um, all right, let's get started here. So just a quick introduction again. Uh, who am I? I'm Timehawk. Um, I'm top analyst with X Trades, which is uh, the trading community. We have a Discord. If you're not a part of that, go check it out. And I've been trading for about uh, a little bit more than seven years now. And I've been with X Trades for about four and a half to five years. Uh, so most of my time trading, I've been part of the X Trades community. Um, 
and like most of you, uh, you know, training at the beginning was was pretty rough. Uh, but I think I have a hang of things now after <laughs> seven years, and I hope that I can share some of uh, my experiences with you so that you don't have to go through the same thing. So uh, I focus primarily on swing trading, and I do scalp and day trade when I have time to watch the charts. And what is the purpose of this course or what the goal is? So I'm planning on covering you know, everything about options from basics to advanced option strategies. Um, just get, trying to give you guys the tools you need to become more effective traders and give you that edge in trading. Uh, because options are, are really complicated. And when you use more advanced strategies, you can make any situation profitable, right? It's not like, oh, you can just be long or short on a stock or asset. You can be neutral too, and you can still make money. So uh, options are great. You can use them anytime. You just have a strategy and when to use it. So I have planned on going through basically everything about options throughout this series, of course. Uh, for the purpose of today's course, it's mostly going to be covering more basic stuff, and then I'll go over the calendar spreads that I was doing earlier this week and how I use them and what to look for and how to identify those kinds of setups. Uh, so more basics today and then one advanced strategy. And then uh, throughout this course, I'll be trying to give you guys practical applications, as mentioned. So at the end, when you have Q&A, you want me to look at a certain stock or you think a certain stock might be good for a certain play, uh, we can go check that out. So table of contents, uh, what are options? So we're going to go over the basic definitions, then we're going to go over the Greeks of the options, and then some of the beginner option strategies. Uh, those are probably the ones you guys are most familiar with. Um, if you guys you know, already know all of this, feel free to tune out a little bit, uh, but I think it's still good to go over the basics. And then we're going to be going over the calendar call spreads at the end, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So what are options? Uh, to me, I basically view options as, they're basically insurance, right? You pay a certain premium to have a contract for an option and then you're just going okay is the stock going to go up or down below this price at the most basic level that's that's how we see it right so we're paying insurance um you know mostly if if you're an equity holder so you hold shares in, in a stock and you want to say protect yourself from downside you can use options to do that uh, but for most of us traders we like to use options as a you know to trade them we like to capture those uh, momentum movements and capture that premium value and then we sell it back before expiration date because we don't want to actually buy the shares. Um, the textbook definition for options, their financial derivative for an underlying security, aka stocks, right? That offers the owner of the contract, uh, I didn't proofread this, but contract the right to buy or sell at a pre-specified price. So that would be the strike, right? So there are uh, two types of options. You have calls and puts. And uh, the calls give contract holder the right to buy. And puts give contracts writers, um, sorry, not contract writers, the contract holders the right to sell. And why do we do options? I like to think of it as the three Vs. They're versatile, volatile, and valuable. Right? Why? Because uh, versatile, because with uh, different options and uh, linking into them differently with advanced strategies, you can use it in any situation. Volatile, why is that good? Because um, it's, you know, you can quickly capture movement in the underlying asset and make a lot more. You're basically uh, leveraged, right? Of course, this also means you can lose more, but um, more on that later on how you can limit that risk and valuable. So breaking down the options components. Um, so these are just some basic definitions here, just so everybody's familiar with them. And let me take a look at the chat for one second here.
yep, I'll be uploading the slides. I just realized I did not need to type that out. I could just talk to you guys. <laughs> All right. Um, moving forward. So the format for options alert at X trades, right? So you have your action. So usually uh, this is just going to be buy to open, sell to close or sell to open, uh, buy to close. So th they're all the same thing. You're either buying or you're selling a certain um, options contract. So then after that, we have the ticker symbol. So, you know, like Amazon is AMZN, Apple is AAPL, uh, PINs is PINS, et cetera, right? And then we have the expiration date. So this is when the contract expires. Um, the most recent week was 2-5. It will always be a Friday or the last trading day of that week. So if there's a holiday or something, then it might be you know Thursday or something like that, or Wednesday. Um, and then if you're trading uh, something like SPY, those have expirations on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then you have your strike. So the strike, and then uh, I wrote it down below, but it's basically the price that you think the underlying asset may reach or exceed, right? And then you have, the at symbol, and then we have the price paid for that contract. So the expiration date is important because that's uh, basically when the, the amount of time you have for your move to play out on your underlying asset. Once we hit that expiration date, if your contract is not in the money, in other words, it, the strike price uh, is still away from the underlying asset price, then that means it's no longer in play and it expires worthless, right? So I explain those definitions below. In the money, ITM, uh, when the price of the asset is past the strike, and I say past the strike because for calls, we want it to be above, but for puts, we want it to be below. So that's why I put past there. At the money is when the strike is equal to the price of the asset, and out of the money is when the price is not past the strike. So uh, again, for calls, for example, if I had Apple, I don't know, um, 200C, so um, 200 strike is a strike and is a call. Then if it's 150, then it's going to be out of the money, right? But if I had, um, say, Apple 200P, which would be the puts, and the strike is 200, and it's $150, then that means we're $50 in the money, okay? Uh, so I, I think you guys all mostly understand this. This is uh, pretty basic information here. Um, so I'm just trying to quickly go through it. If you guys have questions about any of this, you can um shoot me a dm or something and all right option writer so uh this is the entity who is selling the contracts and you can be the one selling the contracts as well so usually we think of the option writers as being more of the uh larger players in the game um and usually retail is the one who's buying up the contracts but we can also sell those contracts. And that's what we did earlier this week with those um, calendar call spreads. Intrinsic value. So when a contract is in the money, it has intrinsic value because um, it's basically the difference between the app asset price and the option strike. So like earlier in that example with Apple, if for some reason Apple was uh, at $180 or something and your strike is $150, that means that our intrinsic value of the option is $30, right? It's just a difference between the strike and the asset price. And then um, you will notice that the options are not going to be priced at exactly $30 because there's still a premium that we are paying for a chance, right? There's still a chance that Apple will continue to go higher or even lower. But basically, that chance is calculated in and figured out into um, the options pricing. And we're going to be paying an extra premium. So say that it's worth $40 or something. So we're paying an extra $10 on top. And that's what we call the extrinsic value. So that's the extra premium we're paying for a contract. Uh, so again, it's basically what's whatever is left over of the price of an options contract after we take out the intrinsic value of the contract. And I consider it basically an insurance premium. Uh, it's, it's just like a car insurance or something. When people write options, you know, they they write a lot of options and they expect that, you know, some of them will pay out and some of them will pay out big. But overall, if they write a lot of options contract, eventually they will collect a nice and steady return. This is what we call basically an income strategy um, to write options. 
And I think it's it's pretty profitable if your account is big enough. And I recommend people to to actually um, sell options instead of buying options when your account is really big. Uh, you can always do both, of course. All right, so uh, more, more definitions here. For advanced strategies, we have what we call legs. And so each leg is a call or a put option that is part of a more complex strategy. So when we open different parts of an advanced strategy, we call, refer to that as legging in. So for example, uh, with a calendar call spread, one leg is going to be, we're going to open or buy a certain contract. So for, for the pins example that we had earlier this week, we bought pins 2 slash 12, right? Uh, I already forgot what the strike was. I think it was ADC. And then we bought it at $1. So that's one leg of, of our play. And then we opened the other leg of our play, which was the short side of the play, right? So we're long pins right now with 212. But now we want to short the other to create our advanced strategy. So the other leg was 25, and we sold ADC, right? So that's, those are respectively called the legs. And you can always open those separately, right? You can also open them at the same time. And there's different pros and cons to doing it each way. Uh, for advanced strategies, I usually prefer to just open it all at the same time. But if you are confident about a certain movement in the stock, like say, for example, you know that the stock is moving up right now. So then maybe you'll just open up the call side or the long side of your play. And then once it reaches the peak and you're like, okay, I think this is the highest it's going to go, then you can leg in and you can sell the other side because that would be that would give you basically more premium value um, to take advantage of on the short side. So this is a way that you can uh, you know maneuver around strategies, different strategies for options in order to be more profitable. Um, but usually for advanced strategies, I just like to open it all at the same time. And um, spread, a spread is a multiple leg option play, and they usually help you limit profits doesn't help you limit profits. I mean, it just limits your profits, but it helps you in that it reduces the risk of the play because it makes it cheaper. Uh, taking a look at the quick chat real quick right now. What counts as a big account? Okay, Napalm. Uh, so a big account... You know, uh, I think somebody said below as well, but they said a uh, 100k plus. Uh, you know, I I think if you have you know 50k plus, you can already start writing some options, right? It just depends on the ticker you're looking to play. If you're talking about something like Amazon, <laughs> frankly, it, it's pretty much uh, you know you, you probably have like a million dollar plus account because 100 shares of Amazon is going to cost more than $300,000 right now, Pro probably like 300, uh, I forgot what the price was, but at least around $350,000, right? But you could play something, you know, like a mid cap or something, or or even Apple, which would be um, Apple's at uh, about 120, right? So that would be a lot cheaper to uh, sell options or write options for that. But yeah, about 50K is where I would say you can start doing some of that. Uh, you know, you just use a portion of your account to do that and then a the portion of your account to do other kinds of plays. Okay. Um, and about the option chain and provide vi visuals, uh, later I'll be going through a calculator and basically going through some stuff as well on there. Um, and, you know, if any of you guys are like, good at sprucing up PowerPoints and stuff, uh, uh, show me a DM because I could use some help with making these look better. Uh, I didn't add a lot of visuals in it. I just kind of went through it. Um, so now we're going for who are the Greeks? Uh, you know, what are the option Greeks? So you might have heard of these before, but basically they're the variables that determine the value an option contract has. So. Uh, when you see an options contract in your broker, they should be able to tell you what um, each of these variables are. Delta, gamma, vega, theta, and rho, okay? So um, 
I know on Robinhood, they don't show it to you on mobile unless you are already in the contract. So that doesn't really help too much. And I, I think most people are probably going to be on Robinhood. Uh, however, if you are on the desktop application for Robinhood, and then you go to, you know, buy options or um, select options, and then you can scroll through the uh, option strikes on that, you can actually see or open up the tab for that for each strike, and it will show you all the variables, what the high and the low of the day is, et cetera, right? So, um, you know, I recommend doing that if you if you really want to take options seriously, because it is important to know these creeks uh, as they determine our profit and loss, right? And understanding these creeks will help us better to know certain types of advanced option strategies. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that later as we go through actual real examples so you can understand that a little bit better. Uh, but for now, let's just go through the definitions of each of these. Um, oh, side note before I do that, uh, you can also use an options profit calculator. Uh, one of the free ones out there is called optionprofitcalculator.com. Uh, it might have an S in it, I don't remember. Uh, but if you Google that, you know, you can find that and you can look at basically all the details of the options contract on there as well. Uh, there's also another calculator I really like to use, and it's called Option Strat. Okay, and uh, that's the one I'll be using later today when I show you um, guys some examples of what I do. So uh, now going back to the slide here, uh, Delta. So Delta is basically the change in our stock price, right? And when the stock price moves. Delta is what affects uh, how much the options contract increases by. The closer the option price, or sorry, the closer the stock price moves to our option strike, the closer Delta will be to one. And that is basically where we get our, uh, essentially our intrinsic value from, right? Because once you pass the strike price, Delta and, um, Will be so close to one that basically your options price and your stock price will be moving more closely together right so uh that's delta and uh, i guess a quick example of that is uh, if for example the delta of a, of a options contract is 30 cents so it'll be 0 0.30 that means that for every single dollar that the underlying asset moves we are moving our options price by 30 cents. So if uh, if you're in calls, for example, then um, delta will be positive. So it will be 0 0.30 in this example. Uh, and then if um, you know the price increases by one dollar for the stock, then our options contract value will increase by 30 cents. If the options, um, sorry, if the stock price decreases by one dollars then it's basically the same thing, right? It would just go down 30 cents, right? Because it will be negative one times 0 0.30. So um, basic math there. And uh, for puts, um, delta will be negative, right? So um, that's because we're shorting. Gamma. Gamma measures the change in delta when a stock price moves. So delta is not static. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the closer you are to the strike, the closer you will be to a one-to-one -one ratio uh, for delta and stock price, right? So, um, you know, usually uh, we don't really think too much about gamma um, when picking up options, but it is important to, to know about because your delta does change as the options price draws closer or further away from your strike price. Uh, it matters a lot more when you start doing more advanced option strategies. Um, Vega. Vega is a uh, measure of a change in option price when volatility moves. So uh, when a stock is really volatile, so that means that the IV is going to be really high, right? So IV is implied volatility, and you'll see that listed in, in your broker as well. Um, in Robinhood, you, if you scroll down, it's along with the other Greeks. It'll show you IV and then the percentage. Uh, but basically, when IV moves up, uh, usually your contracts should be gaining more value. And that's because um, options are uh, more profitable or have a chance to be more profitable when volatility increases, right? So if if you've been uh, you know in the markets the past month, you've probably heard about what happened with GME. Um, 
you know, GameStop has been going up on a rip, right? And the stock price is extremely volatile. So right now, the options price for all those contracts, either calls or puts, they're extremely high, right? And it doesn't really reflect the intrinsic value of, of where the stock is at right now. And But that's because the volatility is so high that basically the insurance company, or aka the options writers, are increasing the value of the premiums because there's a more for something big to happen. And so they need to they need you to pay more premium to get this insurance because now they're like, oh, for sure there's gonna be an accident happening, right? And we don't want to, you know, pay out big bucks unless we're pulling in equally big bucks. Um that's basically how I think of it. Um that's not actually how it works, but it's essentially like that. Data is a decay in price option. Uh, for your options contract every day as expirs expiration gets nearer. So if your data is say a dollar forty or one forty, that means every single day your options contract is going to be dropping a dollar forty. As you get closer to expiration, data actually increases because the chance of your underlying asset to move big is getting smaller and smaller. So that time value um, is basically an exponential curve, right? It decays a lot faster once you get closer to expiration. And then row is just, um, actually, I think this definition is, yeah, this definition is actually off. Uh, I didn't, I should have checked that first. Uh, but row is actually related to interest rates. I think someone in the chat mentioned that earlier. Um, but yeah, row is related to interest rates. For our purposes, we're just going to ignore it because it, it, it almost never affects the options value. Um, there's such a small factor in row that it basically won't affect your value. I'm going to catch up with uh, the chat here. One sec. Yep. Uh, NA blue low, or you, or is it not nah blue low? <laughs> uh, yeah, row is the least important one. You're correct. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Fluch, how can you tell if an option is overpriced? Um, so basically, when IV is really high, uh, usually that's when you kind of know options are overpriced because they're um, expecting an outsized move. And of course, it can still pay out, but chances are against you. Yes, um, for, for the Greeks with a ticker, I will be going over examples uh, more towards the end, basically to sum up basically everything we talked about today. So, you know, give me a moment to get there and uh, we'll take a look at some actual examples. Okay, so some novice option strategies. Um, we have long calls, long puts. We have covered calls and protective puts. So most people are probably going to be most familiar with is, you know, just the basic calls and the puts. Uh, so here I have a table just listing the um, sentiment when you take the play, uh, the max or the profit, as well as the loss potential. So, you know, long calls, pretty straightforward here. If, if you're in calls, you're bullish on the stock. You expect it to go up. Um, in this case, you, you have unlimited profit because, you know, the sky is the limit, basically, right? Um, your asset price can keep increasing up. Unlikely. But technically, yes, it, it, your profit is unlimited. As your asset price continues to move up, you'll make more on your calls. And you have limited loss with a long call because the only thing you can lose is what you put into the play. But of course, be prepared for it to go completely to zero. And that's why options are risky, because they can go to zero. Um, long puts. For this one, you're bearish, so you expect the stock to go down. You have limited profit because the absolute bottom for a stock is zero dollars. It can't go below that. And it's the difference between you know your strike price and where the, the stock currently is. So you have limited profit, basically whatever downside there is, um, up to zero dollars. 
Uh, and then you have limited loss again. Same thing with the long calls. Uh, the only thing you with the long put is the premium paid. Covered calls. This is a neutral bullish strategy. And covered calls are usually used more uh, for income generation. They move a lot slower. They, they earn you a lot less. But I know that um, Daniel S., one of our top traders in X Trades, he uses call covered calls very well. And he, um, I, I think on average, he's up like, you know, 8 to 15 And, you know, you may be like, oh, 8 to 15%. That's not a lot. I can get 100% on, on my naked calls, right? But the thing is, with a covered call, it's a lot safer. You have a much higher probability of play. Uh, you know, you have limited loss because you can't, um, unless your stock goes, like, company goes bankrupt and your stock goes to zero, you're, you're probably not going to lose that much value. Uh, with covered calls, the way you play them is that you have 100 shares, right? So you have to have 100 shares, and this is um, basically your option writing, right? You're writing calls out. You're selling calls. So you have 100 shares of, say, Amazon or something, and then you sell, say, 4,000 uh, C for this week. So every single week, as long as Amazon doesn't go over $4,000, you're basically collecting that premium for free because you're already holding the shares uh, long. It, it doesn't cost you anything to hold because you, you're, you're bullish on Amazon. You want to hold Amazon. So covered calls is basically when you like a stock you want to invest in a stock, you're bullish on it, but you don't think that it's going to go above a certain price. And then you just basically collect the premium every single week from this um, strike sold. On the other hand, uh, you know, with covered calls, you have a limited profit because if the asset goes up to your strike or past the strike, you're no longer going to gain any additional value. With covered calls, you won't lose anything if the stock goes up because um, your stock will gain value up to the strike price right and then you also gain whatever premium you sold the strike at uh, it's just that when it goes over your strike then you have lost that potential because now you have to sell shares at the strike um the, at the strike you sold because whoever bought those contracts at 4000 c for example they're going to exercise their call to buy amazon at four thousand dollars 100 shares at amazon at four thousand dollars if it's in the money because if Amazon is say four thousand one hundred dollars, they're going to be like, "Oh, I'm going to buy, you know, exercise this call four thousand um, dollars, or hundred or four thousand times one hundred, right? And I'm going to profit that extra one hundred dollars immediately. One hundred dollars times one hundred, right? So that's ten k, instant ten k profit. So uh, if it's in the money, they will exercise it, and you will lose your shares. So that's the only uh, that's the major risk of covered calls is that you can lose your shares. But there is no um, big drawdown because, uh, you know, usually you'll sell a far out of the money call and you're just going to be collecting a little bit of premium while the stock price slowly rises up. Okay. Um, Dran's world, what's generally a low versus high IV? Great question. Uh, because, you know, sometimes contracts can have 20% IV, right? And that's normal for it. But you have other stocks that are regularly over 100% IV. Uh, you know, I think Amazon this past week was uh, probably like 150% or something like that. Um, but there's no, the best reference to find out what a low or high IV is, is to compare what IV for that stock normally is. Because we want to know what the normal is for that stock so we can have a relative gauge of how high or low the IV is relative to how it normally trades. Because there is a reason why stocks, some stocks have higher IV than others on an average basis. And that's because certain stocks move a lot faster than other stocks. Like I remember I used to, um, when I was a kid, I had, I had Disney stock. And Disney, like in the five years or so that I owned it in a joint account, it barely moved up. It moved up like 5% or something, I think. So it basically didn't move. So you would expect a stock like that to normally have low IV. Of course, Disney is different now because now it's kind of a tech stock and tech stocks usually have higher IV. And that's why you see Disney's um, popping up so much in trades these days because it actually moves a lot faster now because it has um, Disney Plus 
making it a, a, a sort of a text doc. Um, and the best way to determine, again, high IV or low IV is to compare with average. And the way you can do that is by finding out what IVR is, which is IV rank. Uh, I'll, I'll go over that uh, with a website in a bit, um, just to show you how you guys can figure out if it's high IV or low and what the normal is. Uh, for GME, three day, uh, let's see, you say 1,000 shares of GME, should he be selling January 22nd, 500C? So the thing about um, GME is, is that, uh, yeah, as Pathway said, you would do that if you're bullish about GME. Because you have to be at least neutral or bullish on it to do that. Um, and the reason is because GME can still drop, right? And we know for a fact that GME, where it is at, is not exactly fair value. Of course, it was suppressed for a long time, and that wasn't fair value either. But we know that it should be somewhere in between. And right now, it's still on the high side. That's that's just my opinion. Uh, you know, take it for what it's worth, right? But I think that GME is overpriced right now. So if covered calls on that kind of position, you're going to be losing money if... Um, because in reality, I think that the price should be lower than what it is. So if you had a thousand shares at say seventy dollars and it drops to say forty dollars, then you're losing thirty dollars per you know um, per share, right? And your five hundred C contracts, uh, you know, might not hit or whatever. But I bet the premium is high enough to cover that kind of a drop. Um, but basically, you can plug all these things in into a calculator to see where the break even points are. To determine whether you should take a play or not. Always use the, these calculators with an actual chart to determine what your predicted range of an op or sorry of a stock is, so that you can basically cover the max drawdown as well as the max upside. Um, that's how I like to use these calculators. Um, okay. Protective puts. Um, so that's the next strategy here. Um, so this is when you're bullish on a stock, so you still want to hold shares of a stock, uh, but you aren't sure and you think that maybe the stock is going to drop down. The cover calls is different because you are uh, long on a stock, but you're still kind of bullish on it, but think that it might just be stagnant for a while or not move up as much as you want to. Puts are basically when you expect a drop down. So this is what you do when you want to hedge your portfolio. If you have a big account with a lot of shares and you want to make sure that you're not losing too much in case of a market correction or a market crash, that's when you would take protective puts. And so with a protective put, um, basically what you're doing is you're buying a put at a certain strike because it gives you the right to sell your shares at a certain price. So basically, uh, you know, you still have unlimited profit here, similar to the cover calls, because as your asset value increases, you will still gain value because you're holding shares. Um, but the downside to this is that you basically paid an insurance premium because you're like, oh, maybe the stock is going to drop. So I'm going to get these protective puts here so that I can make sure I can sell at this certain strike price. And if it drops below, I can exercise that put so I can sell. Um, Sell my strike or sell my shares and be protected from additional downside, right? So that's the point of a protective put. But you, of course, if the stock keeps going up, basically you just lost your premium, right? And um, but it's just insurance. You you basically only use and you're paying an insurance to protect yourself from it from a market correction. That's when you would use protective puts. If you own 100 shares with one broker, is there any problem with selling an option with a different one, or is that essentially a naked option? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically you're basically uh, naked shorting an option at that point because your shares are on a different broker. I mean, realistically speaking, uh, it would still act as, say, a covered call in that scenario. 
but because you don't have the shares on that particular brokerage you sold the contract on, uh, you, you don't have, um, it's not covered on that particular broker. So that bro broker would probably require you to have a collateral in order to make sure that, you know, if things go belly up on you on that uh, options contract that you sold, that you have the money to pay them back. Um, so, you know, you would do it on the same account. Uh, otherwise, you would need a lot of collateral in order to do those kinds of plays if you have it on separate accounts. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Advanced option strategies. So when we're talking about advanced option strategies, the previous one were called novice option strategies. And the reason why is because they all have limited loss. Okay. All of them, you can only lose what you put in. And they only have one leg to the trade. What makes an option strategy advanced, um, you know, by our basically our textbook definitions, is when we have more than one leg to the trade. And if you remember earlier, uh, that just basically means we have multiple parts, multiple contracts in the same play. So the benefits of using advanced option strategies is that you can have very versatile plays and make every situation a profitable opportunity. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them today. There's dozens, probably even, you know, hundreds of different strategies out there for advanced option strategies. Uh, but some of the more well-known ones, and, and these are more like intermediate strategies, are going to be iron condors, calendar spreads, diagonal spreads, butterflies, strangles, and straddles. Okay, those are probably going to be your um, more intermediate level types of advanced strategies. And... Uh, for today's purpose, I'm only going to be going through calendar spreads. Uh, you know, when we have our next course, as we move along, I'll go over the other strategies as well and when we use them. Um, do these advanced strategies require a margin account? So that depends. Uh, but yeah, typically you would want to have a margin account in order to do advanced option strategies because it gives you more flexibility. Um, because I I don't think you can sell uh, or option right without using a margin account. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, I trade these advanced option strategies on a margin account. And for a cash account, uh, which is the only cash account I have actually is on Webull, uh, I only do, you know, calls or puts on that. Um, but yeah, I, I use margin. When you are day trading and trying to scalp, how do you quickly check all the Greeks and calculate? Because most of the times the price moves very quick. So, uh, so that's the thing. For day trading and scalping, usually you wouldn't be using an advanced option strategy because if you're day trading and scalping, you're just trying to immediately capture on a quick volatile movement, right? And for quick volatile movement, the things that are going to gain the most are just going to be your calls and your puts, your basic calls and puts. Um, so for day trading and scalping, calls and puts are going to be your bread and butter. Uh, you can still choose to do a more advanced strategy. For example, you can do a bull or a uh, bear spread. So basically, you, you, um, it's what we call a vertical spread. You have same expiration date, and you have two different strikes. So you buy one and you sell the other and it basically limits your uh, risk because you have you pay less for that play but you're still bullish or bearish all right uh and then you know for advanced option strategies it usually is something i plan out beforehand uh when i do advanced option strategies because they usually are going to have a more a longer time frame kind of play so um Usually I don't worry about the Greeks too much if I'm just playing momentum, a momentum play. Because as long as the stock moves up, we're good. Or as long as it moves down, we're good. Uh, but if you want to quickly check those things out, uh, you can always plug it into a options profit calculator or optionsstrat.com. Uh, both of those you can use to calculate um, your profit. Or see the Greeks, sorry. Okay. All right. Hello, oh, double seven. Are you are you on uh, the X Trades account? Nice of you to join us today. 
All right. So uh, now we're going to get to the advanced option strategy I wanted to talk about today. Uh, it's calendar calls. And if you remember earlier, we talked about covered calls, right? So you have to own 100 shares to do a covered call in order to sell a certain option strike, right? Collect that premium. A calendar call spread is basically a poor man's covered call because we don't actually have to own 100 shares of the stock because we have a long contract that basically acts as our um, long position. And then we sell a shorter dated options contract, uh, which is basically what you do for a covered call. So you actually use them in very similar situation, but calendar call spread is a lot cheaper to play. Of course, it, it also has more risk than a covered call. Um, but you know, with greater risks, we also get greater rewards, okay? So this is one of my favorite option strategies. Uh, and normally, okay, normally, when do you use a calendar call spread? Normally, you use it when you are neutral bullish for a stock. So again, same as covered calls. Going over to Greeks. So um, if you don't remember what these mean, uh, let's take a look at that previous slide. I'll, I'll have this PowerPoint uploaded somewhere later today. Uh, but basically with the Greeks, you have your delta positive on a covered, um, sorry, not a covered call, a calendar call spread. And it is slightly positive up to the strike, right? Then uh, gamma is negative. So as a, um, as the underlying asset or stock price increases, your delta value actually decreases as well because you are short on the closer contract and long on the further dated contract. The shorter dated contract has a little bit more volatility or reacts more strongly to changes in price. And that's why uh, we're gamma negative here. You're originally delta positive because your further dated contract should have a higher delta than your shorter dated contract. But then once we pass the strike price or get really close to strike price, this flips around and we become delta negative. Uh, and that's again because we're gamma negative. Um, so when, say for example, for Amazon uh, calendar spread I played earlier this week, 3,400 C. Anything below 3,400, I will be delta positive. Any gain up to 3,400 strike is good for me. Anything above 3,400 strike is bad for me. Because, and if you, if you think about this just from the perspective of buying and selling, we sold the 3,400 C for 2 slash 5. If it's above 3,400, we have to buy that contract back, right? And now it's going to be worth more because it's in the money. If it's below 3,400 strike, that means that that contract we sold is going to be worthless on, on you know, Friday, which was yesterday. And then we just collected the full premium. If it's in the money, we actually have to pay money back. So that's why, um, you know, understanding the Greeks is, is important here. But you can also just think about it logically, right? So we want it to close exactly at 3,400. Because that's a point of inflection where we go delta negative from delta positive. Um, and again, delta is, is that measure for the gain in your options pricing uh, based on the underlying asset. Vega. What is Vega? Um, again, just a refresher for in case you guys don't remember already, but Vega is uh, for volatility. The higher the volatility, um, the more options contracts are going to be worth. And with a covered, um, sorry, not a covered call, keep reading covered call. For a calendar call spread, you are still Vega positive, even though you're short on the uh, shorter dated contract, because the Vega on the shorter dated contract is going to be less than the Vega on the further dated contract. So we benefit when volatility increases, actually, normally, okay? <laughs> theta. So theta is that time value again, right? Every single day, data is eating away at those calls. So we are actually positive data on a calendar call spread because data value is higher on a shorter dated contract. Because there's, as we get closer to the expiration date, there's less chance for the underlying asset to move. Therefore, data on a shorter dated contract 
is always going to be higher than the further dated contract. And uh, this is what we mean by collecting premium, right? So if you have two contracts on a cover calendar, or sorry, on a cover call or a calendar call spread, actually it's the same thing. We get more value as time moves on, as we get closer to expiration of the front dated option. Um, so how do you profit from it? So uh, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but basically you achieve max profit when the asset is exactly at the strike price that you picked when the option expires, the front dated option. And basically you're collecting premium on the front dated option while the back dated option retains value. Uh, yeah, I will share one example of a calendar call spread in a bit. Okay. All right. Uh, calendar call spread more on it. Okay. So how do you actually open the calendar call spread? Um, basically you're selling to open the front dated contract. So we're short on the closer contract and we are long on the further dated contract or the back dated contract. So for example, we can sell to open two slash 19 ADC on pins, right? And then we can buy to open March 19th or 319 ADC on pins. And then you close it by doing the reverse, which means that I'm buying back um, 219 pins at ADC and then I'm selling the um, 319 ADC on pins. Okay. So when do you use calendar call spreads? Again, you're supposed to use it when you are neutral bullish, right? So according to Google, right? <laughs> this is what I found out when I first. Uh, started looking into these advanced option strategies. You're supposed to use calendar spreads when you expect low volatility. Or, sorry, maybe not when you expect low volatility, but when there is low volatility. And this is true for your normal everyday activity. The reason for this is because, if you remember, we are Vega positive. Our backdated contract will rise more sharply with increases in volatility. So that means that if you know, the, we already have low volatility. Chances are volatility will increase in the future, and that increases our profit margin for our options play. And then the other side of that is, for a regular calendar spread or even covered calls, what we're hoping for is that basically not much is changing with the underlying stock, right? We, we want it to stay at a relatively low price, close to our strike, because we are data positive. We are long data. We are collecting money as that front dated option loses value faster than the back dated option. And so if, if we have low volatility and nothing's happening to the stock, that's great for us because we don't have to worry about you know losing profits on uh, the stock going too high or too low. We just basically collect data. And, and this is you know um, an income strategy, right? And that's why uh, you know you might see some people who who are like to say like data gang or whatever, right? Because they're um, playing a lower risk kind of play in order to create or generate income consistently over time. Now, here's the caveat. What I did this week was opposite of this, right? We had very high volatility. So how I use calendar call spreads. Uh, for those of you in the X-Trace trading discord, you know that this week we use calendar call spreads to profit during earnings reports. So ER or earnings report, they're typically highly volatile events. And this is reflected in the implied volatility of the option, right? So you can look up these numbers. You can look up these IV values of the stock. And remember again, the way to know that if it's high relative to normal or not is by using IVR, which is IV rank. Now, again, Google said to use in low volatility. So why was this strategy effective, even though ER is a highly volatile, highly volatile event? Sorry. This is because we are capturing the IV skew. So basically, there's a difference in IV between the front dated contract and the back dated contract. This will always happen when we already know that there is a big event coming up. So for example, if, if it was, you know, Amazon, maybe they, they have Amazon Prime Day or something like that. Usually you might, um, or you expect like numbers to come out for Amazon, right? 
then maybe IV is going to be really, really high for that week because people are expecting like, oh, they're going to report blowout numbers or they're going to say and announce a new project uh, at like Apple Day or something for Apple. They'll, they'll have a product launch, right? And it's the stock is going to skyrocket because the product is so good. The expectations, IV is very, very highly elevated on the contracts nearest to those kinds of events. And ER is one of those, right? Because we know the event is coming. We know that, you know, this underlying asset may move a lot because of ER. It can drop 20%. It can go up 20%. Who knows? ER can do anything. People are uncertain about the markets during ER. And that's why we have IV skew. The front data option is going to have very high IV because of anticipation of the event. The back data option or a further data option is going to have lower IV because it's further away from that event. So there's more time, more time for that contract to regain its normal value, whether the stock goes up or down. And that's why with ER, we have that big gap in IV spread. So uh, because of that, this strategy was actually effective in high volatility because there's a skew, because of expectations of people. And all we're doing as we're trying to profit on that IV crush after ER. This is why you see a lot of people often ask, you know, how come Apple or whatever stock had a blowout quarter, they had an amazing ER, and the stock price is also rising, okay? And I have calls, but how come I lost 50% of the value of my calls? This is because of IV crush. Basically, we're trying to capture on that IV crush of people who are actually buying those contracts. And we have the backdated call to protect us. Um, the cons here is that there's a different vega between front data and back data, right? So your back data benefits more from vega or implied volatility increase. So we're betting on an IV crush here. In the case that the back data and the front data for some reason drop, both drop dramatically in IV, which is unusual then we're actually going to lose value because we're long Vega. Um, but I don't typically expect it to, to happen because with ER, usually your skew is just really, really high, and we can profit off of that IV gap difference. So some examples, uh, you know, if you were in, in the Discord chat, you probably saw these already. Uh, I'm going to catch up with chat real quick here. One second. Okay, so just for fun, uh, is it better to get calendar spread on tickers, which have events on Thursday after hours or Friday early hours to get max IV squeeze value? Uh, and the answer to that is actually yes. Um, oh, I see 007 already answered that. Uh, but basically, because the closer you are to the expiration day of the front data contract, the the faster you will, um, the faster that front data contract will lose value, right? Because it's an exponential decay, both from theta as well as uh, IV crush. So if there's an event on, say, Thursday um, evening, which is, for example, the pins play that we had earlier this week, and I, I have it here, right? Uh, you know, we can get a lot more out of out of it um, if it goes our way. Okay, so uh, the two plays I took this week for a calendar spread ER plays is Amazon 3400C. Uh, I sold to open the 25 3400 strike and I bought to open um, the 2 slash 12 3400 strike. It cost me $1,500 per calendar spread and my gains were between 70 to 110%. Those were where I exited the play. Uh, I checked and followed up on it on Friday because I sold it on the same. Um, on the day right after the ER earlier this week. I checked it again on Friday just to see how they were doing, uh, what would have happened if I had you know, kept it or whatever. Um, and I saw that uh, they, they actually reduced to like about 40 or 50% value. Um, and that's because the price moved away from my strike. 
So that's why we have to be aware of both time factor and our strike, the possibility of our main near our strike by expiration. So, so again, going back to our pins play, this was actually a little bit easier to do because the event was on Thursday evening. So we only have one day to play out to expiration. So it's easier to see if that price will stay within that range, right? Um, so it cost me 97 cents to take that play, 80 strike. I sold to open 2.5 and I bought to open 2.12. And, you know, it opened up at 40% up. And then by the end of the day, it was up about 110%. Uh, so, you know, it gained a lot more value throughout the day because the front dated option was expiring quickly. So there was a lot of time value that we could capture on that. So now I'm just going to visit um, an options calculator and we can, you know, play around with it and see um, some examples, right, of stuff we can look at. So if anyone has any, you know, plays they or tickers they want to look at, um, just put it in the chat and we can take a look and see if we can find find any place for it. Okay. So the website I'm using is optionstrat.com. You can also use optionprofitcalculator.com. Um, I prefer optionstrat, but uh, you can take your pick. I like this website a lot because uh, basically they have a strategy... So for those of you who, you know, aren't familiar with options as much and uh, aren't really sure when to use what type of strategy, uh, this could be a good option for you just to play around with to see what the perspective stuff is. And I, I'm just going to go in real quick to, to show you guys. Um, so for example, uh, here's a ticker, SPY, right? Let's just pick something else. Or I guess we could use SPY. It doesn't matter. Uh, here you can pick, you know, your sentiment. Are you bullish, bearish, or, or neutral? So depending on which one you pick, they're going to change the strategy, and they simulate the trades, and they tell you what your percent chance of profit is, how much you risk, what your profit is, and what percent return that is, and they tell you what, what to buy or sell. So bull cost spread, bull put spread, a strap, a uh, big thing. And I, I think this is a pretty useful tool if you're not familiar with option strategies already and just need, you know, like I want to play this this way. I want to see what my risk and reward is and how much I lose. What's the percent chance that I will hit it based on, you know, standard deviation movements of the stock. Remember to always have your own bias, though, because if you know something like you, you know, you chart it out, you know, it's going to rise or you think it's going to fall in a certain range, you use that kind of bias. Right. And that's how we win with options. Uh, by using our, our knowledge and our bias in order to find profitable trades. Uh, here you can select um, the strike, or not the strike, the expiration date for, for the play. So you, can, you can, if you want to play a shorter dated contract or a lot longer dated contract, you put that here. Uh, again, shorter dated contracts are usually going to return more for the same cost if you expect a big move soon. Longer dated contracts are going to have better chance. It, it's, it's always going to be a risk-reward kind of thing. Um, I used to play a lot of weekly. I still do. But when I play weeklies now, it's literally a lot of for me. Most of my plays are going to be further dated out, at least at least monthly contracts, right? So there's going to be like February 19th, March uh, 19th, and I forgot what April was. I think it was April 16th. I, I play those contracts because um, it's less risk for me, more likely to be profitable. It gives me more time for my plays to play out. Uh, it says what the target price here, and that's just based on your sentiment. So I pick neutral, it goes to 387, which is the same price that it's currently at for SPY, bullish 392, and very bullish 397, right? So you can actually enter in your own price here as well. And then uh, that's basically what your expectation you are, and it calculates these option strategies based on that target price you set up here. Okay, uh, taking a quick look at the chat here to see what tickers you guys are suggesting. Give me a moment, please. Walmart has ER on February 18th. Interesting. Uh, how do you determine the ratio of sell to open and buy to open when playing spreads? Um, great question. So normally when doing spreads, I'm going to be doing a one-to-one -one ratio usually. But sometimes if you have a certain bias, 
you may change that ratio, say two to three or something. Uh, or you want more downside protection, then maybe you get more of the short side. Um, but usually that's where you would take those kinds of plays and change the ratio, sell the open and buy to open. Uh, normally, for I'm usually just taking them in a one-on-one -on -one ratio. Got a lot of tickers here. Uh, currently in a bull call spread, this crazy C203. For TTD, 760, 900, 900, 60 spread. You got in at $17 per spread. You're bullish on TTD, especially going to ER, but not sure what my best exit strategy is. Actually, let's take a look at that. So uh, here they have the selection for all of the different strategies. Uh, and if you hover over them, they actually tell you, is this bullish? What's the profit look like? What's the limit loss? And they show you the graph of the profit and loss based on the strike price. And uh, once you get in there, you can you know mess around with the graph and play around with the numbers to see what the actual profits and loss look like. Um, but yeah, and they have a slight description of you know when you would take the calls or take that play. Let's take a look at TDD first, though, here. So you are in a bull call spread. So let's pick that. Uh, and we are in TDD. Let's trade this. Yep, cool. And you are in 716, 900 to 960. So that's July 16th, 700. So there's a slider here. And if you click on the um, the flag for the options contract, it'll pop up this uh, toolbox or toolkit. Or I don't know what these are called, actually. I forgot what they're called. But basically, um, it pops up this box here with all the details of the options. You can see the bid and the ask. Uh, do note that um, option strat is delayed. By 15 minutes so it's not going to be uh accurate to the current time uh, but it works for us if we're doing research after hours which is usually when i'm doing my research for advanced strategies um so then we see all the greeks here delta theta gamma vega and rho uh, again usually i ignore rho um low volume so there's actually not a lot of a lot of interest in this strike um and ivy so this is 64 percent here then we got our bottom which is the one we're selling so we're selling 760 in this example right so here it says negative one so that's how you know that it's sell uh, always check this when you're doing your profit calculations just to make sure you're, you didn't actually accidentally flip your play around uh, you can also switch this to negative as well right so um, just showing you guys how that works. And you can also change it to put if you want by clicking this button. And if you want to add or make your uh, strategy more complex, you can add options here, buy, sell calls, buy or sell puts. Uh, usually when you do these kinds of things, you're just trying to reduce or minimize risk, uh, but that will also reduce your profits. Um, and then uh, here you can flip it. So basically it goes to show you what that does here, right? Uh, and then this is mid or middle or bid ask. And so usually I pick bid ask because uh, I want to assume that I'm getting the worst possible price. And even if I assume I'm getting the worst possible price, if this chart still looks good, then that means that, you know, it's a, probably a good play. Uh, but, you know, usually it's more reasonable to be something in between. But just know that for options, sometimes the spread is really, really wide. And at those times, you're not going to get an ideal price. But look how big of a difference it makes if you just hit the ask. You're paying $4,100 for this play. But if it's a middle, it's about $3,440, right? So that makes a big difference. Uh, there's a chance of profit here as well. And it's just based on um, the variables the, of the options contracts. Uh, how profitable it is you know, actually depends on how, how it moves. And then it shows you here, if you click uh, on the lower right button, it shows you what your Greeks are total 
for the play. So uh, you see here that delta is 0 0.032, right? If we just look at the 700C, we see that delta is 0 0.75. Okay? And we look at 760C, we see that delta is uh, negative 0 0.69. And the reason it's negative is because we're short, right? We're minus 1. That's why it's negative. So the difference here is 0 0.032. That means for every single dollar TTD moves up, we're gaining 3 cents on this spread play. If you were full on bullish and you were not afraid of downside risk, then you would prefer to just get a naked call because you, you benefit more from that delta. But usually, uh, you know, we, we always, there's always downside to be expected. And uh, if it takes a long time for a play to hit our price targets, then a spread is a good option because it reduces our theta risk, right? Because theta is only two, two cents. That means every single day I'm only losing two cents on my play. If I just had this 700 C, I'd be losing 36 cents a day if TDD isn't moving. So that's a big difference, right? Uh, I'm not going to go over the rest of these um, Gamma, Vega, and Rho. We, we kind of already talked about it a lot of times. I think I'm just beating a dead horse at this time. Uh, but, you know, all these variables are here, or, or these Greeks are here for you to look at uh, to see how your play is going to play out. Okay. Going to catch up on chat again. Uh, just give me one second here. When I sell a covered call and the stock price immediately increases and my broker shows I have a negative return, does that mean I'm losing the premium? Hmm. Uh, yeah. So um, when you sell, when you do a covered call and you sell the strike, you've already collected that premium, right? So it's, it's not a debit play, it's a credit play because you already collected that money for selling that strike. If the stock continues to increase, um, that means that your strike is probably increasing in value. And when you, when you, um, you know, if it goes in the money, that means you have to buy it back or you're selling your your hundred shares. So uh, yes, you are losing a little bit on that play. Um, but how should I say this? If you're considering the whole play of the covered call you're probably not losing money because if the stock is going up, that means your equity is also increasing. And uh, the point is that as long as it doesn't move above your strike for the calls that you sold by expiration, you're just going to collect that premium. Even if, you know, the stock rises, say $10, but it's just right under that strike, maybe that premium uh, for that contract you sold will increase and you're losing money currently on that covered call play. But as long as it expires worthless, then you're fine. Uh, but even if it goes past that, you won't necessarily lose on the play, and that's because you're covered by your shares. I'm not sure if I answer your question there, uh, Fly, but you know, let me know if that didn't clarify that. I see a lot of you folks are helping out in the chat here. I see a lot of people answering your question already. Uh, how important are volume and open interest? Uh, super important. Uh, the more high those are, the more basically essentially interest in those options, and therefore your spread is probably going to be smaller. When there's not much interest in that option, then the spread is going to get a lot wider, and it's going to be harder to get fills. And then you're going to have to hit the bid and ask to quickly get in or out if you if you really want to get in or out. Um, so volume and and open interest is is really important. Oh, the play was nine hundred nine sixty. Sorry. Uh, same principles apply, though. <laughs> Let me change that real quick here. Yep. Uh, if you want a beginner resource for option trading, that link by 3-day is pretty good. Investopedia um, has a lot of good information. Uh, when I first started trading, Investopedia was my resource for everything related to trading. Um, you know, they, they give you a pretty good overview of everything, and they pretty much have all topics covered there. Uh, it's a really useful resource, so check that out. Uh, but, you know, otherwise, I plan on going through 
options as a whole um, every two weeks until we basically finish or dry up my knowledge of options. All right, going back to this TTD play here, we have July 16, 9960 spread. So, you know, really, uh, when would it be best to get out to take profits? Essentially, you know, the higher, if you expect the value to continue to increase, as in uh, the stock price to continue to move up before your expiration date, that's where you would take profit, right? When you finally think you've hit the peak. So the higher it is, the more money you make, right? And there's a max profit at some point, 3,905. And that's capped because of your spread width, right? So with a 960 to 900 C, this is a bull call spread. Our max profit, or sorry, not max profit, the max value of the contract, um, this contract play is going to be $60 or $6,000. So that's what you see here. Your net debit was 2,095 because that's how much you paid for this um, play. And I know you didn't pay this much, but uh, that's based on current price value, right? So 2095. So then you have 6,000 minus 2095. The max profit you can gain is the remaining value up to 6,000. So that's 3,905. Um, your break even is 920.95 at expiration. So if you expect a stock to continue to move up, then you would just hold it. Right until you get close to max profit. Normally, what I would do is I look at percent of entry cost, and I see what you know what profile looks like, and um, you know I never expect to hit max profit. Hitting max profit is highly unlikely. And in fact, if you wait until max profit, chances are the trade is going to turn against you, and you will lose value. So usually, I, I would just pick something reasonable, like you know at most I would expect like maybe a hundred percent. At most, right? If I see anything higher than that, then I'm lucky and I'm I'm, I'm selling. Um, and with spreads, uh, when we usually with advanced option strategies, you gain more value as you get closer to expiration date because the volatility of um, the difference between these um, starts decreasing and it's more likely to remain in this range. And that's why you hit max profit um, closer to the expiration date. So even though we're at you know one thousand dollars on February eighth, for example, and this is above our nine hundred nine sixty C, so in in reality we should be having six thousand. It should be worth six thousand dollars. We should already be at max profit based on the intrinsic value of the play, right? But it doesn't work like that because um, there's still a chance that before expiration these contracts are going to lose value and and maybe TTD goes down, and that's why as you move across the board you see. Uh, so really. Um, when it exit this play, is it's just going to be up to you based on your own chart analysis. Uh, once you think you've reached a peak in the price and it may start drawing down, um, then that's when you would exit the play. And then if uh, you think it's going to remain neutral, but it's you know above above 960, then you can just hold on to it for a little bit longer and try to collect a little bit more premium value on it. Uh, but just remember that there's a lot of opportunity cost here um, by holding on to this because you could be entering into a different play. Uh, instead of just waiting for this time value increase, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but usually if uh, there's a large increase in the short term and we're already like deep green, say like it goes up to 1,150 or something and we're up like 70%, which is right in between here, I would just take the profits right away. Because uh, there's, I mean, like I can, you can wait, but you're waiting, going to be waiting a long time in order to just collect another maybe like 30% or something. And by the time it expires, you don't know if it's going to be in the money or not, right? So uh, it's just a matter of balancing risk and reward. You can also use this graph here to see how it works out. So there's a slider here, days until expiration, right? So this is the profit and loss based on uh, expectation that is um, Friday, July 16th, which is when your spread expires. So you just use this dragger. You can change it to how many days until expiration. And you see, you can visually see how your profit and loss changes, right? Let me go back to profit and loss and numbers. So, uh, yeah, again, you can just play with this around, see see when you would like to take profits. Um, again, with trading, I think the most important thing is to have a target or goal in mind. You're not just going to hold something and just be like, oh, I, I'm just going to hold it until you know I make max money or something like that. 
you should always set a goal for yourself and be like, you know, if we hit 50%, I'm going to take half my position off. If I hit 100%, I'm going to take half my position off or something like that. And then you'll have your, your position covered, your initial invested amount is returned already, and you can just let it ride. Um, so those are the things I would do. If you have multiple contracts in a play, always set target prices. Uh, of course, do it based on your expectations of price. So like, you know, if, if my expected price is only $1,000, then, you know, just take take profit there. Um, I don't think I probably answered your question that well, uh, honestly speaking, but, uh, you know, I hope that helps a little bit. What adjustments could I make to the TD bull call spread if I'm bullish on the ticker? I mean, if you're really bullish on the ticker, you could always just buy back this 90, 960C, right? And just let this run. That's if you're really bullish. Uh, I mean, otherwise, you could just, you could always add another call or something. But basically, at that point, it's a different kind of play. A bull call spread is used when you are bullish on a stock, but. Um, want to protect yourself from too much downside risk. I played Penn's calendar this week. Two questions, please. You mentioned pick the one with high IV. What is considered high when selecting a ticker? Pens, we picked ADC and hope it did not fluctuate too much off ADC. But with Amazon or Google stock can jump a lot higher. How to pick the right strike? So I picked the strike I did because I was bullish on pins. I expected pins to go up. Okay. Uh, I think the bad part about this calculator is I can't go back. I, I can't. I can't simulate past trades anymore, so I can't show you what that looked like. Um, so let's just do instead Walmart, because I know Walmart has ER, right? Uh, when's, when's Walmart's ER? Actually. All right, yep. Walmart's ER is February 16, 2021. So the closest strike to that would be the February 19th strike, right? Because that's the uh, week of the ER. So we will look at February 16th, and this wouldn't be a bull call spread. It would be a uh, sorry calendar call spread here. Pull that up. So February 19th. So OK. And your backdated option can be you know anything you want. Uh, usually for these kinds of plays, I, I play more aggressively, and I choose the, like, the closer dated option. But if you want to be more conservative with the play, pickings, uh, something further out, like 30, 60 days out, is usually going to be better. So you see here the chance of profit, 57%. If I just pick one week out, if I pick March 19th, it's 64%. And if I pick April 16th, it's 66%. Basically, pick dated option um, has more chance to recover any lost value if something something weird happens, right? Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to look at 19 and 26 for, for the example here. So, uh, in order to figure out the strike, what we do, what we do is we take, um, you know, our chart here and we, we kind of project what we expect it to be, uh, for pins, I picked ADC again. Uh, why? Because I was bullish on pins, but not super bullish. It ended the day on Thursday. I think it was around 77 or 78. I don't remember the exact price. Um, and I expected it to go up, but I expected uh, it to be within a certain range. And so I picked ADC, our, um, our spread, right? Our spread allowed me to cover a very wide range. So it was green at expiration, which was yesterday. Um, I don't know if anybody has a picture of that uh, calculator image that they want to post up or upload somewhere. Uh, but basically, we had a very wide range from. Let's just pull up the chart here. I think it makes it easier to explain. 
pins, right? Uh, this is trying to super zoomed in here. Okay, so pins. We we had ER, right? And it spiked all the way up to eighty eight dollars in after hours, and it came back down. Uh, so usually I always expect that, um, earnings reactions is going to be pretty volatile. Uh, I was bullish on pins because so many people were bullish on pins, so I, I felt pretty confident that it was going to move up. And one of the reasons I picked ADC was actually because of this. So if you look right here at this pre-market the day before we took, uh, the day before um, ER, right? The top of the pre-market was 79.70. So I felt pretty confident that pins was going to have a bullish ER report, and so it was probably going to go up. Uh, but I also saw that it wasn't able to pass pre-market highs. And so I kind of picked my ADC based off of that because I was bullish, but not too bullish. And then um, as for the rest of it, uh, it you know, it, I wish... Maybe I should just load up my regular chart here so I can see those lines. One second, please. And if uh, I'm getting really slow at getting back to you guys on chat, apologize for that. So we got pins here. And did I not chart this chart? Hmm. Maybe it was this one. All right, I can't find uh, which chart I actually charted pins on. Uh, but basically, I had levels drawn out. Um, and then I saw that the pre-market high was about $80 on the previous day. And then uh, I also charted out the regular patterns, you know, like I put in my trend lines and stuff. Notice it dips below that there. Uh, I think there was a better trend line somewhere. That's an interesting. But then we had this over here, so that's not valid. Uh, but basically, we were in a bullish channel. I can't find the chart that I actually charted pins on anymore. Uh, but basically, I had a bullish channel and um, I had a projected price. Or maybe it was this I was looking at. But I projected that the price would, you know, probably not exceed $100. And uh, if it dropped, I didn't think it would drop below, say, $76. I felt like there was a high prob probability it wouldn't go below this peak right here, right? So I, I had my support and resistance lines in. I had a projected price. And then I looked at the previous ER, right, uh, which was October 28th. And I looked at what the price did. And I was like, oh, it went from... $48 to $70, that's that's a big jump, right? It went up like, um, I can't do math right now, about $30, no, $20, $22, right? So that's $22, and I think it's maybe like 40% or something. Uh, this is just some quick mental math there. And we, we see the same thing, the previous ER, so it went from 25 to uh, about 37 so that's a 12 point increase again. So I, I'm not really sure what percentage that is, but it's close to 50, 40 to 50 percent, somewhere like that. So I looked at all the previous ERs and then I looked at this one and I was like, oh, it actually dropped and it went up to 15 from 22 or something like that. Um, which is again about a 30 percent decrease. So considering all of those things, I factored in what you know what my expected price range was based on that. Um, and that's why I picked ADC. Uh, but I, I think 007 also brings up a good point. I don't know if he mentioned it in chat or if he's still here. Uh, but you can also look at expected move for um, an underlying asset. And the, the way you do that is... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how you calculate it, to be honest. Uh, 
Uh, but if you if you're on like Tastyworks or something like that, you can figure out the expected uh, move of the stock based on the options pricing. So options pricing and the, the interest in it and stuff like that for the uh, for that month or that average, it will give you an expected move that the stock will move. All right, I think I'm kind of going all over the place here. <laughs> uh, let me look at chat for a second. So three day, you said you have a PLTR spread for this week. You close the 35 call leg when it was at the 31 support and sold the 34 call leg when it hit 34 the next day. What other exits are there for a spread? You don't always sell both legs at the same time. Uh, so yeah, that's correct. Uh, we don't always exit um, both legs of the spread at the same time. Uh, if you if you're confident uh, and and you know predicting a certain movement, um, then you can always exit out your position of the spread when it's most profitable for you, right? Like, for example, on pins, for example, if I expected that you know the bottom was going to be sixty four fifty or something like that. And if I had a uh, a bull call spread, for example, so say that I bought to open, I don't know, 60C and I sold to open 80C, then I can buy back the sold to open 80C at 64 if I expect it to bounce from there. And then when it rises up again, I can uh, sell my long side call, right? So uh, really, you're just doing it based on what you expect of the chart movement. And this is why having legging in and legging out uh, with strat option strategies gives you a lot of flexibility in your place um and you can do all this you know without using a day trade because most people just you know they, they only buy or sell one call uh, but in reality if you use a spread like this you can take advantage of both the up end movements in a day without using a day trade right i i'm a little bit wary of recommending this to people though because i think that a lot of people might over trade with this kind of trick and they find themselves in a lot of positions because they keep, you know, they buy to open, say, a call here at 64.50. And then when it goes up here to 76, they think it's going to go back down. So they're like, okay, let me sell the, the strike above it. And now they collected all their money back and then they open another play and they keep doing that. And pretty soon they'll find themselves in like dozens of different contracts on the same ticket, right? So uh, I'm a bit wary about recommending that. Um, but it is out there if, if you're interested in, in using spreads uh, like that in order to avoid day trades. Um, I often use this leg-in strategy to protect my profits and uh, to give myself a continued bullish bias on a free play. So like, for example, if, if we bounce over here and that's when I bought, and then when we reach over here, if I saw a higher strike for the same price I bought my lowest strike at, that's that's basically free money because the my spread now can still continue to go up in value, but I've already locked in the profits because I took my premium back by selling a higher strike here for I are the same or more than what I paid for down here. So um, that's just basically a free a free running spread. That's why you call them. What are the blue yellow bars on the right side of the? Uh, I assume you're talking about this chart over here. And I just realized I have I have Bitcoin on here. Let me get rid of this. <laughs> uh, okay, so these yellow and blue bars here are just volume profile. They show where um the stock is most thickly traded. So if you look at these volume bars at the bottom here, you have red and and green volume bars. Uh, wherever these are. That's basically where you see the most volume. Like when you see these volume spikes, where this price range is, that's where the most volume is. Volume profile basically figures that out for you without 
you having to manually figure that out like like oh yeah there was a lot of volume here or I traded for a long time over here maybe there's a volume shelf over here so usually i use these as uh, potential support and resistance areas like rough support and resistance areas the more volume there is there the stronger it is going to be if there's not much volume uh trade in a certain area it's when it goes past this area in terms of price uh chances are it's probably just going to go straight through because there's not really much volume trade there before um this is what we look for when we talk about gap fills so this is the same principle as a gap fill uh gap fill principle because in reality there's a gap here right for for er the gap on this day and that's why there's not a lot of volume traded here we see that it, you know it, it tried to fill the gap over here already and then it bounced back up and that's why we have some volume here now but it's still a relatively volume dry area uh, and will likely blow, blow through whenever we reach this zone um that's how i use volume profile anyways i uh, hope that answers your question about that So buying on February 5th versus February 8th. Friday versus Monday, when to buy option for weeklies, keeping in mind data. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a, a one in size fits all answer for that it really just depends on what you expect for the price to move uh i mean in, in the end we if you're just taking a weekly play you're expecting you know momentum right you're expecting high movement if you weren't expecting high movement it'd be better to take a spread for example or or some other kind of advanced option strategy that mitigates you know that data risk um, because if you're not expecting it to move, there's no reason to buy on Friday. Uh, so, so basically, it's just if you're expecting it to pop up over the weekend or something, or maybe you you know something like, oh, they're probably going to drop news this weekend or something that's bullish for it, then that's when uh, I would take calls or something. I'll take it Friday at close. Uh, it's better to take it at the close of the day because data does affect throughout the day, right? Uh, you know, data is how much value your options contract loses every day. But in reality, data is decreasing throughout the whole day. Okay, um, and you can see that on on the graph here. So, for example, on up options strat, uh, you can see it says days until expiration zero here. But if I move this slider over, it see it says 0 0.8 now. Okay, or one day. So throughout the whole entire day, um, the options contract value is changing, and data is is eating away at the contract too. Um, and that's why you get this more sharp outlook once you get closer to expiration date because um the extrinsic value is basically gone right the premium is gone by the end of the day And yeah, uh, in regards to to the data question about when where where it kicks in, uh, you know, usually on Friday you'll see a bigger drop in your data, uh, but you know, over the weekend, from Friday close to Monday open, you you'll still see some difference, right? Um, and and you can just it's just like regardless of where is the weekend or not. Uh, basically, if if I have this ticker here, it's at two versus one point nine, right? It, it's always moving. It's but Friday is when you will see the biggest, um, likely see the biggest drop by by close of day. So if you're gonna take something over the weekend, take it at the end of Friday is best. Uh, but again, you're just trading based on your bias for movement over the weekend. If you don't expect anything to happen over the weekend, then you just wait till Monday. Um, that'll be safer. Uh, and that's just because there's a lot of volatility possible to happen over the weekend with, you know, any news, right? You have basically have two days of possible events to happen that can shake up the underlying price. Not because of the options price contract itself, but because of, you know, the broader market. Um, so that's what we're looking at there. Which app is this? Uh, this is optionsstrat.com.
So for a question from Just for Fun, do you suggest getting a spread for NVIDIA and 550 call from FunTrade selling front month option for same price? So the thing about that is you only do that if you expect the stock to not move that much or to go up slowly. Uh, that's the only time you would do that. Um, another way to do that would be to just take a regular spread, right? If you want to avoid data from a slow moving option, then you take a spread. It just take 550C and sell 560C or, or 580C. Uh, basically, you base it off of where you expect the max price of that underlying asset to go by that expiration date. So uh, usually I wouldn't do that unless you are actually um, not bullish. Like you're actually neutral on the stock. That's the only time I would uh, use a calendar spread. Um, and of course, the other situation you would use for calendar spread is for when IV is we have IV skew because we're just trying to capture IV crush. That's the reason why our play is profitable. So profitable, even if we um, if it you know, moves up a lot or down a lot. And that's because we're just capturing IV crush on that pins calendar spread we had earlier this week. So looking at Walmart for the calendar spread, uh, ER is the week of February 19th. or pick February 26th. Um, I'm just gonna pull up a Walmart chart so I can go over what I'm looking at here. Uh, again, sorry if I got sidetracked a lot here. So, Walmart, what's going on here? So I always look for support and resistance right, lines, right? First thing I usually do is I draw in the support resistance lines and I find a trend. Uh, I always put in the trend. Oops. Interestingly enough, uh, looks like Walmart broke down from the trend a couple weeks ago, that last week, trying 26. Uh, that's kind of not looking that great, uh, but that's a trend we have there. So I'm just going to quickly try to plug in all these support resistance. But support and resistance, we're always looking for tops and bottoms. Any pivot points, as long as there's multiple touches of it, it's usually a good point to use. Uh, and that's how, I, how you basically determine it. And you also look for any like um, all-time highs or peaks, right? General areas of possible resistance. Uh, I feel like there might be some kind of head and shoulder here, actually. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. Let me put it in here. So if you look at here, right, you guys see this head and shoulders? This is a neckline. But on the other hand, um, you know, maybe it'll go back up here. Because that would still be a head and shoulders pattern, right? You would have the head here, left and right shoulder. But it, that would be a very ugly looking head and shoulders, but it will still be one. Uh, anyways, possibility, but who knows? Um, yeah, okay. So looking at this chart here, this, it, that's the support. We have one touch here, two touch here, right? It went down a little bit below as well. Uh, you can also use fibs to identify more areas of support and resistance, and I, I do that fairly regularly. Uh, but I'm just trying to be quick here. It's interesting that uh, Walmart on Friday rejected back to this top level right here. So, uh, not feeling too confident about Walmart here, actually, but. Um, I mean, long run, it should be, it should be good. So we'll take a look at it. And then possible, possible consolidation triangle right here, right? So we could go up to here, do this, bounce up, break out, maybe go up to here, this level. Uh, that's what I would be looking at. Um, yeah. And also with a trend line break. Usually what you see if you break the trend line, it usually return back to test, retest the trend line. So I, I pretty much expect it to uh, go back to, at least up to here, right? And then reject again, if that's confirmation of a breakdown, right? Uh, 
that's what we look for when we play breakout plays. I always look for the confirmation before playing playing it. Because uh, otherwise, I would be buying over here as support because I would think that the trend line would hold. If it breaks down, I would wait until it, it retests and then rejects again. That's when I would short it. Um, getting off topic again, just talking about <laughs> things I look at. So for ER, ER is on the 19th. See what I did on the previous ERs? 148 to 154. $6 move. This ER over here, uh, 137 down to 129, so $8 move. Over here, we see a massive candle here, 131 to about 124, so it's about $7. Um, so yeah, let's look at this one too, right here, 105 to 115, so that's $10. So I would expect that, you know, on the day before, if I'm taking this play the day before earnings report, which is February 18th, according to TradingView. So I'll take it on February 17th. You can take it earlier that week if you want to, if you're confident about what the range of the movement is. Then, um, you know, my expectations would be that it wouldn't move more than, say, $10, right? And in reality, what I would expect is that it would it would follow my patterns. So I'd be like, okay, so if, if it breaks out instead of rejecting at this uh, trend line resistance, then maybe it'll go up to 151 or 152. And then at the lowest, I expect it to at least maintain support down here at 133. So that would be the range that I'm looking at. And um, again, you can look at the expected value of the move based on this, but you can also look at the expected value move based on the options price contracting. Uh, yeah, you can Google that. I have to look into that myself on how to calculate that, but I know some um, brokers actually provide you with that information. Uh, and it's just based on the options pricing. That's how they calculate it. So based on that, I forgot why I said it already. Did I say one 151, 152 to 133 is my max expected range? Right, right now it's 144. So if we look at this February 19th and February 26th contracts, we're looking at the IV, right? The IV is 29% on the backdated contract, and the frontdated contract is only 31%. So you see here our range of profitability, our break-even, I think they, they usually tell you, yeah, so your break-even is between 139 and 151. So that's at the point where I would be at zero, right? Like I wouldn't make any money, but I wouldn't lose any either, which is, which is okay. Uh, your chance of profit is 57%, so that's not too bad. Um, but of course, with ER, you never know what will happen. So I expect, you know, 151 to act as a resistance, 133 to act as support, right? So that means I'm pretty much covered for the upside here. To the downside, I have some risk. Percent entry cost. I could lose almost all my value if it actually goes all the way down to this support here. And uh, the reason why this play isn't as, I'm just say, easy to take as a pins play we had earlier is because the IV is 31% versus 29%. There is only a 2% IV difference between the front spread and the back spread. That means this is basically a regular covered call play. In other words, we just want neutral, neutral movement, no movement, and we just want to collect on data, the difference between the data. So we see here data is point, uh, 1.7. So every single day I'm collecting 1.7 cents until it gets closer to expiration date, then it will increase, right? Um, but yeah, bas basically with this kind of play, because there there's no IV skew, it's only 31% versus 29%. Basically, there's no IV crush we can capture on this play. So it's um, not, very, not a very high risk reward play for an ER calendar call play. Instead of doing a calendar call play, I would play play something else, right? Uh, because a calendar call play for ER is I just want to capture the the difference in the IV to capture IV crush, and that's what makes it profitable. 
So not a good example here. Um, does anybody have another ER they think is a little bit more hyped up? And uh, I'm gonna catch, try to catch up with the chat real quick here. Yes, IV crushes when IV goes down. Uh, usually IV crush is what we refer to when we have an ER report because before ER we basically have high volatility expected after ER the result is already known therefore the volatility sinks because we already know what the results are there's no more surprise factor to drive up the value of the options of course volatility can still continue to increase after ER but that's only in very unusual situations. Usually we expect that after the event, IV is gonna drop because the event is known. There are no more unusual factors that will cause IV to increase. And a good example of this would be GME, right? You saw all the Wall Street bets, um, the Reddit, right? They went all in on GME and the IV of contracts shot up because there's so much demand for it. So uh, that's not even related to ER or anything, like nothing, fundamentally changed on those particular days like there were some fundamental changes like you know they had board stuff changed that cohen is on there uh stuff like that but there were no other like real changes other than just suddenly there's an increase in man because of wall street bit so sometimes you can't predict possible events that can cause iv to rise but usually with er we expect iv crush to happen because after the er the results of the er are already known and we no longer have that increase in volatility because the the biggest Thing that was holding stock down or up or whatever is already known. Um, so that's that. And thanks, uh, 007, for answering a lot of questions in, in the chat. And I know a few um, others of you, like Young Bulls, helping out too. Appreciate that. And three days. Okay, um, TLTR, DKNG, okay, let's take a look at uh, DKNG maybe, when's DKNG's ER? Very soon, a couple weeks, two weeks out, it's February 20, February 23rd. This almost looks like a double top, but we'll see. I feel like it should break over it. Uh, clearly, I rejected that on Friday. Uh, tested it. See if it breaks out later. So just drawing in trend lines here. Uh, usually when I see a trend line break down, I expect it to return back to the previous long-term trend line, and that's why I do this. Um, that's how I trade anyways. So this is a pretty good previous resistance, access, new support, okay? So you'll, you'll see this or hear this adage a lot. Uh, everybody says it, and this is proof of that happening right here. I'm going to draw in some fibs just for the fun of it so fibs or fibonacci why do they work uh they're just natural numbers that we look out for and i think it's mostly because of algos and stuff too now um but you know with any kind of trading strategy and things like that um they work because it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy right um we expect double tops to happen because everybody's looking at the same thing. They're like, oh, we're back at all time high. Maybe we'll go back down. And then because people think that and they decide to sell, we go back down. Uh, that's kind of how trading works. It's just a, a game of mental psychology between you and other participants in the market. 1.72. Interesting. All right. Anyways, not really sure where D King is going to go, to be honest. DraftKings. 
but let's take a look at those contracts and see if there's any IV skew we can take advantage of. So February 23rd, so that would be February 26th, and we can take March 5th. Uh, again, as I said, you can always take a longer one to increase the likelihood that you'll remain profitable. And remember with a calendar call spread, you can actually, um, if you're still bullish on the stock, after the front dated option expires or you collected the premium profit on it, you can just uh, buy back this front dated option and leave your back dated option if the stock continues to rise. And then it'll just be like a regular long naked um, and you'll continue to profit off of that, right? So that's also an option for people if if you uh, are still remaining bullish on the stock. For mostly for my purposes, though, usually I'm just trying to capture the IV crush uh, because you know it's just a safer play, um, more highly profitable, more likely to be profitable, and I just close both of them at the same time. Uh, but if you're still bullish, you can definitely you know hold on to it. A good example of that was Snap. Um, this past week, Snap. Snap dropped a lot, but then by the end of the day, it, was, it just kept rising, right? So if you had a calendar call on that for some reason, um, then you know you could have just gotten rid of the front date option when it was worthless, basically, because it dropped today. Quickly pull up the chart here. Uh, we can see that because it was intraday, so... Uh, basically, the previous day was at 58, and then it dropped down to 53. So it's a $5 drop after ER. So that front day option was probably like not worth very much. So at that time, you probably could have bought back in, and then you could have just rolled, rolled your um, call up, right? So that's just an option for people. If if you remain bullish on the stock, you can leg in and leg out like that, right? Uh, back to DraftKings here. So ER, calendar call, play. Uh, what's the difference between IV? Again, there's not much of an IV skew here. A double oh seven. If you're still in um the chat, do you normally notice IV increase as we get closer to expiration, as more people anticipate it? Because maybe we're looking too far out to see that IV skew. That's what I'm thinking right now. But uh, I I'm not sure because I don't. I don't normally pay attention to that until it's like the actual week of ERs. So I I didn't really notice if um, IV increases before ER, like just right before instead of being two weeks out. That's why the IV is so similar right now. No idea. <laughs> All right. Anyways. Uh, currently, there's no no IV crash to be had here. The IV skew is only two percent, so there's no real profit there, unless you are just neutral on DraftKings and you think it's just gonna stay at sixty four dollars the whole time. I would not take this play <laughs> right now. So I'm having troubles finding something. Um, so now I know a lot of people asked earlier and in chat they DM me as well, like how do you find these plays? How do you determine what uh, when's what is high IV, what is low IV, stuff like that. Um, so before, right before ER is definitely a good time to capture that IV skew, but here, another way to find that is to use some screeners or scanners and a free one available to you is barchart.com. Don't go to barcharts.com. No S here. Uh, if you go to barcharts.com, it's like a website for, um, selling like study tools and stuff for like cheat sheets, that kind of thing. Uh, but barchart.com is a useful free resource. Um, you can also subscribe to them uh, and it'll provide, you know, better data, more real-time data, et cetera. But you can just use this tool for free uh, at the end of the day to do research if you want to. Uh, and this is usually when I would do research because during the trading hours, you're not really going to, you're not, you don't want to do your research during trading hours because stocks are already moving, right? So we always do it after hours anyway. So I don't really find a problem with just using the free version. Um, which is available to everyone without a sign-in. So you can look at IV rank and IV percentile. Uh, all these tools are useful depending on what you're trying to play. Unusual options activity is basically like, you know, options flow, stuff like that. If you see a lot of people buying a certain option strike, maybe you can take a look at that stock too to see if it's worth playing the same side, you know, follow the money, right? Um, so that's an option. 
Uh, but for our purposes of our calendar call ER plays or just calendar calls in general, we want to capture an IV skew difference. So we're going to look for things like percent change in volatility or IV rank and IV percentile. So here you see IV rank, and uh, it actually gives you the definition here if you hover over them. So IV rank is um, the at the money average implied volatility relative to the highest and lowest values over the past year, past one year. If IV rank is 100%, this means that IV is at its highest level over the past one year. So that basically means that there's a lot of interest in a certain ticker right now if the IV rank is at 100% compared to usual. This is how you know if it's high relative to usual or not, because every stock will have different IV levels. You see here that, you know, 8% on Apple, 19% on Tesla, 91% on AMC. What's going on there? Well, I think we all know the answer to that already. Um, you know, it's related to GME and all those other short squeeze pumps kind of things. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of IV in AMC. And actually, uh, I might have, I don't remember if I told 007 or not, but I, I know I told some people when AMC was at $2, 250 or 260 on Friday, I researched AMC over the weekend to try to figure out what was going on with it. I, I saw that AMC, I'm just going to pull up the chart here. I saw that AMC's bottom was like about $2, right? Or I mean, I need a daily chart, uh, auto. So it's the, the bottom, absolute bottom for AMC has been about $1.94. So I was pretty confident that you know it wouldn't go any lower than a dollar ninety four. So what I did is when I saw this high IV spike on AMC, I actually bought shares of AMC. I bought eight hundred shares of AMC. You know, just a thousand uh, six hundred thousand eight hundred dollars or something like that when I bought it, um, and I sold covered calls on AMC because the premium of of those AMC calls was so high relative to the cost of, of the shares. Like I pay about 250 to 280 per share, right? And you know, the option contract is like three dollars or something for out of the money call for like 350 or something. So basically like when when you see um, that your options contract that you're selling is worth a significant amount of the underlying asset price, I think it's worth taking that risk to do that because, uh, frankly, it's a good risk reward opportunity. At the lowest, I only expected it to go, excuse me, go down to about $2, you know, but I have the covered calls premium to cover me for part of that move. And chances are it was more likely to rise. So I, I actually took that opportunity to do that. But the way I found out about AMC actually was um, uh, last month, before you know, before GME completely blew up, it had already moved a bit, but before it completely blew up and it went to all these other stocks like AMC, Nokia, uh, BlackBerry, those kinds of stocks, um, I was using this bar chart and to screen and scan, and I was looking for percent change in volatility, and I noticed that AMC had a huge jump, and so at that moment I decided to jump in because I was like, I'm bullish on AMC, so that's why I'm buying shares and I'm selling the covered calls because. It protects me from down, possible downside if AMC suddenly announces bankruptcy. Uh, but the cover calls premium to the share value was so high. Like if you can get 10%, 15% back on covered calls for, for shares, and you you know you have a well-defined support that you don't think is going to go down below, I think it's a good risk-reward opportunity you should take. So uh, barchart.com, again, useful tool. Uh, take advantage of it. So we're going to take a look at IV Rank now. Um, so 100%. So these are things that are really, really high right now. Uh, you know, you probably know a lot of these. I think, I feel like 007 probably covers some of these, right? Like SPACs and stuff like that, right? So I know some of these are. Uh, we have CCIV here, which is another EV play. Uh, you can see that IV rank is 100%. That means it's the highest IV it's at for one year, right? Remember, that's the definition. And currently, IV percent is ninety percent. So um, these are the kinds of things I look at uh, if the IV is high. So and then I just go and put it into the calculator and be like, okay, CCIV, what's going on with it? Maybe February nineteenth. CCIV only has monthly contracts here. 
February 19th, March 19th. Is there an IV SKU? There is no IV SKU. And that's because there's no... So you normally you wouldn't expect an IV SKU. But when you do see an IV SKU, a calendar call spread can be good. Um, anyways, I sidetracked a lot again. I'm going to catch up with uh, chat here. One second. Uh, thanks, 007, for your answer to the question. So, yep, IV does tend to increase right before a big event, right? That makes sense. Uh, and yes, uh, you can drag the IV slider on the call or the play. So, uh, you know, when IV increases, Premium contracts for all contracts goes up, puts calls, whatever. If IV increases, there's more chances of some kind of crazy move happening, and that's what the options are pricing in for. So when your IV goes up, you become massively more profitable. If IV drops, then you become massively red, right? Um, you know, usually you don't expect such a drastic change, but you expect some change. And the reason why the calendar call spread works in this case is because the front dated has more IV than the backdated by a lot. So there's an IV skew. So even though uh, IV is dropping, the front one loses more faster than the back one, and that's what we're profiting off of there. Uh, for that calendar call play. Thanks, 007. You can take a look at Twitter or something. Twitter. Uh, ER is on February 9th. I assume that's after hours, because, uh, oh, never mind, that's Tuesday. So that's fine. Um, but I guess we'll take the play on Monday or Tuesday then, if we do that. Twitter, 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 Twitter is just going up, huh? Cup and handle? <laughs> This is so far back, 2015. <laughs> I think this is a cup and handle, right? <laughs> I think this was a cup and handle, but I don't know. Uh, not really. You can see it dip back down here, but this is, this is kind of a stretch of a cup and handle. But anyways, um, let's plug in the resistance points here. Previous. You can see that I rejected at all the previous resistance, right? Previous highs. Uh, and that's why usually I use these as possible price target areas when I do plays and stuff. Um, but of course, this is so far back. And uh, it's probably going to be take a while to move up to these price levels, but we're just going to put them in anyways. I can't put it at the top here. All right, I give up. Uh, <laughs> Supposed to be over there, but it's fine. All right, zoom in back to our current levels. I think this drop on Twitter here was related to all the uh, stuff happening at the Capitol and stuff, right? And uh, Trump being banned and all that stuff. If I remember correctly, I think that's around when it happened. So we got this perfect trend line support here from March lows. Great support. This was a good buying opportunity, honestly, right here. Because it dropped down badly on news. Uh, and usually news reactions are overreactions. It hit support. And so that, that was a perfect time to buy, actually. Um, 
I missed that opportunity. I don't I don't think I've ever traded Twitter. Maybe once or twice. It's not a ticker I normally look at. So there's nothing there. But yeah, okay. I'm probably gonna do a fib. That there. So for fibs, low point, high point, right? This is a retracement fib. Normally you expect levels to possibly act as uh, either price targets or a possible resistance. A lot of times it would just blow through too. Um, but I always put them in because it gives me good price target areas so I know I can take profits at a certain point. Uh, and that's probably one of the most important things when trading is like a stock can always go up and keep going up, but you have to set goals for yourself because if you're just if you just keep holding and you don't set targets for yourself, uh, a lot of times, like sometimes you might, you know, hit the home run, right? But a lot of times you'll just find that, you know, it goes back and it goes against you uh, if you don't take profits. And then um, you might trade emotionally or something and revenge trade, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's always good to trade with a plan and have certain price targets in mind and be like, I'm going to sell 50% here. Doesn't matter what, what it does after that, but I'm going to sell 50%. Um, so, yeah. Just general advice. Something like that. Maybe adjust this a little bit. Or I guess I could use this. So if I was a bear, <laughs> uh, I'd be looking at this as like a possible falling or sorry not falling rising wedge and i'd be like oh it's gonna keep going up and at some point it's gonna break down right that's what falling wedges do is supposed to be a bearish reversal pattern basically uh but there's so much room here for it to go up still you know honestly i I'd wait to see what it does over here because I feel like this could be a possible resistance area. If it blows past it, then this then this pattern is no longer valid, right? But currently, this matches up pretty well, right? We have top, top, three touches. It kind of broke past it, and then it rejected back in, and then it had to drop all the way back down to support of this pattern, right? So, you know, my projection would be that we're going to have a dip by opportunity. But... At the same time, with ER this next week, I have no idea what's going to happen. I, I can do anything. <laughs> Does anyone have any insight? <laughs> Tuesday after hours? Yeah, thanks. When you draw a chart, trend line, support, resistance, FIB, price target, etc., do you pick daily chart for an year or one minute for a day, etc.? Uh, good question. So I always do my basic charting on a daily first. Then I will move into lower time frames when I'm actually trading. So if I'm looking for entry on something, I'll be on like the 15 minutes because I'm primarily a swing trader again, right? So I'll be on the 15 minutes and I'll be like, oh, maybe we're going to see resistance over here we're going to drop back down to 53 and then i'll enter over here for a play or something like that if i'm uh bull, bull bias for example right so you always um on the 15 minute then i'll i'll rechart it right so i'll be like oh there's actually a, a trend line on the 15 minutes and let me get rid of the extended hours i don't really like to use extended hours when charting because the volume is lower so i can be like oh look there's a trend line here on a shorter time frame maybe we don't go all the way down to 46 for my perfect entry, right? Maybe we just go back down over here. It is fib line and it also matches up, you know, with the trend line. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'll take it at 53. If we go back to 53, maybe we'll just bounce up here and then we'll go like this and then we'll break out. Um, if we reject down here instead and we break this trend line here, once we break this trend line, I'd be like, okay, we're probably going to go back down here. So I only look at this information on the lower time frame charts, like the day. I day of like pre-market or something like that when i'm going to take a play on a certain thing or if i'm just day trading and then of course i'll i'll be using these shorter time frames 
uh, my favorite time frames are like three minutes or like scalping day trading kind of thing. And 15 minutes if I am looking at day trading, but also considering maybe a possible uh, short swing into like the next day or something like that or next couple days. Uh, but yeah, always chart on all different time frames because if you're looking at it on the daily, like that time or that trend line looks great on this 15 minute chart. You're like, oh yeah, it's probably just going to bounce off of here or whatever. But if you look at the larger time frame, you're like, this is actually a really, really steep rise. Feels like it, it should, you know, get some kind of pullback and then it, it can keep going, right? Um, you know, it's really steep regardless, but you know, you expect to see some kind of pullback when it rises this sharply. So, hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, I always chart first on the daily time frame. Stronger uh, patterns are always going to be found on your higher time frames versus your lower time frames. And this has to do with the volume. Because on your daily chart, your volume candles are, are more thick, basically, right? Whereas on your 15 minute, you'd be like looking at a lot less volume on your patterns. So it's less likely to play out as expected. Um, it's still valid though. Twitter? I think Twitter is probably going to be bullish still for long term. Uh, but anyways, taking a look at this chart here. And now you can see how messy the chart is. On TradingView, here's a little trick you can use. If you right click on your settings, of uh, your pattern, your line, or whatever, you can go to visibility for it, and you can be like, oh, I only want to see it on hours or minutes. I don't want to see it on the daily because it, it obstructs my view, right? So you can get rid hide this in the daily view so you don't see it. So we're going to do that so we can see better. And this, remember this timeline, or trend line, sorry, that was on the 15 minutes. So it's probably not very useful for the days. So I, I don't need this line here on the daily chart because it doesn't really tell me much, right? It's just going up, right? So I'm going to hide it on the day because it's useless for the day. Uh, I might keep it on the hours just because it might still be valid on that level. But um, yeah, I always hide those things if they're not applicable to the time frame I'm looking at, right? So we see here that we passed over 55. Um, my next price target area would probably be you know, probably around here, 59 or something. Uh, horizontal ray. Put that in. Uh, that's not the top. Yep, okay. Um, I think that's pretty close, about 59. So that's the level I'd be looking at if we break out past this trend line. Uh, the first. So maybe we hit hit this, we bounce back into the trend line, and then we go back up again to confirm breakout. Uh, but honestly, this this pattern is so steep that I feel like it should correct at some point, right? And this is a wedge, and rising wedges are a bearish pattern uh, once it completes, right? It's it's bullish up until it, you know, a certain point, and then once it breaks the falling wedge uh, support trend line, it should retrace back down. And usually the way you find that out how much it's going to move by is a measured move. Every pattern has a measured move. So we see here 39 or about 40, right? Down to about 20, uh, 19. I'm just going to say 20 for, for ease. So the difference between that is $20. So when this point breaks, wherever that point is, I would measure be like, okay, we're going to go $20 down. So say we go up to 60. Then I would expect us to go back down to like maybe 40, 45. Um, usually I don't expect a full move. So I usually multiply this difference by about 50%, and that's my actual price target. So if we go up here to say 60 or something, and then we, or 58, uh, where this resistance is, and then we actually break down, then maybe we'll go back down to about 45 or so, which would be would um basically match up with these highs over here, which I would expect to act as some kind of support, right? Um, see some support here too. So that's that's how I would look at that. And because this is a new chart layout, I have zero indicators on here. So let me pull up some indicators. BPVR, see that volume profile. Not very useful here because it's not very heavily traded. And this recent area time frame. 
uh, basically all the support is down here in terms of volume, right? All right, anyways, going back to our option strat calculator here. So February, well, that would be for this week because the, your ER is on the 9th after hours. And then we would sell February 19th. So there's actually IV skew here, right? Notice IV on 2.12 is 121%. And the one on 2.19, the week after, is 90%. So there's a 31% difference in IV. And if you remember all the other contracts we looked at that <laughs> didn't work out, the IV difference between the contract was like about 2%. So uh, that difference is really small compared to what we see here. And again, that's probably because we're getting closer to the ER and people are buying up these contracts because they expect some kind of big move to happen. Um, as the 7 called it, I don't, I don't remember what he said actually, but I think he said premium chasing, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So there's actually an IV SKU we can take advantage of here. This IV SKU isn't as big as um, pins. For pins, I think we had like over 100% IV SKU. So that's why pins was such a good call because I was confident that even if it wasn't close to my ADC strike, which is what the strike I picked, like if it went up to 100, we would still be okay. Like we would be break even, about break even at about 100, but we would still be okay. And then we could go all the way down to like mid 60s and still be okay for pins. And, uh, you know, we got lucky and we hit the nail on the head and pins closed at $82, you know? So we, we made really, really good money on, on those calls um, because we got lucky. But even if we're not lucky and we, you know, predict wrong essentially, and it goes further out of our range, uh, it was still a highly probable play because the IV skew was so great. Twitter still has an IV skew and we can take advantage of that because it's 30% um, is still decent. Uh, but basically, we're looking at the chart here, see what our profitability range is. So uh, sometimes I'm not really sure how this calculates the break-even stuff. Because it says 51.09, which is correct. Um, but there's also a top, a top to the break-even, and it didn't put that number in. So uh, I'm not sure how this calculates it, but um, yeah, I just use a chart here, and it'll probably be better. So we can have a range of about 70 to 51, right? Maybe even 71. I think it's close to break even around that point. Right, 71 to about 51. So that's basically our range. Uh, normally, you would probably prefer to take profits the day after ER because um, IV crush is already happening at that point. Uh, if you wait longer, at that point, you're just almost like playing a regular calendar cost spread, which means that you're net neutral and you just want to collect time premium. So this is a time premium, that additional time premium you can collect as you wait over time. Uh, however, we just want to try to chapter the IV crush of the event. And, uh, you know, we don't, I basically, I don't want to risk having the stock move suddenly big up or big down from that day that we take profits at. So that's why usually I do it after. Uh, sometimes it's, it's still profitable to hold it on through all the way out and let the front data option expire. At that point, it'd just be a, a data, data premium collecting play. So, see here. 71 is 61, right? So this definitely covers our upside, right? Because... I mean, it could go up a lot. Uh, I forgot how much we said. Did we ever look at how, how much Twitter usually moves? I forgot. 38. I'm like 50. So that's a $12 move. Here we, we see like maybe a $5 move there. About $5 there too. Here we have a bigger move, 33. 36 so that's about six seven dollars uh, this one was a lot bigger here 40 down to 30 so that's ten dollars so yeah um this was probably the biggest one 
twelve dollars. So that's kind of what I would expect, right? Twelve dollars. So that would give us down to forty four, and it goes up to sixty eight. So if it goes down to forty four, we actually lose quite a bit. Most of our options contract premium. If it goes up to sixty six, we're good. So basically, at this point, you have to determine what your bias for the play is, and this is for sixty C. So if I'm feeling less bullish on it, then I can move down to fifty eight C, for example. And um, for calendar call spreads, I do recommend using out of the money strikes. I wouldn't get in the money strikes. So like I wouldn't pick fifty five C. Uh, the reason for that is because of extrinsic and intrinsic value. If if I pick in the money strikes, then there's less um, more of the contract value is going to be intrinsic value, and less of the value is going to be extrinsic value, right? And what we're trying to do is again with these calendar ER plays, we're trying to capture that extrinsic value play. So uh, if there's more intrinsic value because it's in the money, then I have less to earn from data data premium basically data decay, and I have less to earn from from that difference, right? So I like to play out of the money kind of call spreads for ER. Uh, just explaining that. So we look at 58C compared to 60C, right? We see that it shifts the um, play down a little bit. So now our break even is 49.84. So I moved about a uh, dollar, dollar. 16 cents or so, I think. Uh, so that gives us a little bit more downside leeway. Um, yeah. Frankly, I'm not sure about how I would play this, though, just because I'm not sure what Twitter is actually going to do here. If it breaks out, it could go really far. And with ER acting as a catalyst, that could easily happen. But on the other hand, you know, the downside of this trend line is all the way down here at 47. Like, this pattern is very much valid, right? We have multiple touches. One, two, three, four touches on the bottom. Uh, this one got close, right? One, two, three, possibly four touches here on the top, too. So, you know, I would expect to, to go back down to this bottom trend line at some point. Um, and that's a lot of downside risk. And with the ER, I don't know what, how their ER is going to do, right? That's that's not the point of this calendar play is to predict what the ER is going to do, but to try to just capture on IV crush, right? So, it, you know, if it's bad and people react badly to it, it could go all the way back down to this support at 46. At that point, this this play is not going to be very profitable at all. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I would take this play. Uh, but, yeah, that's basically what I look at and how I assess where I'm going to take a calendar play or not. Um, if I'm really bullish on a stock or something, then I'll take a play. Uh, the real reason why I took pins is, again, because of that widespread that we had on pins when I analyzed it, and that I saw that basically we would... There's there's almost no way we would move out of the side of that range, so we would be profitable no matter what, and that's why I took that play. And I also took Amazon um, earlier this week, 3,400C, and... The reason why I took Amazon 3400C is because we were trading in this consolidation zone, right? And uh, I think we broke above this before ER. I don't, I don't really remember anymore. I think we broke above it before ER, right? But I actually took the calendar call spread before that happened. I, I did it when it was still inside this consolidation triangle. Uh, why is my chart so weird? Oh, there we go. Didn't have auto on. So, um, you know, Amazon's been trading in this zone for like, I don't know, six months or whatever, five months. <laughs> uh, but for a long time. So my expected range was that I was expecting it to be landing between three thousand three hundred and three thousand one hundred thirty, and that um, it would be within this area pretty much no matter what with ER. And I expected it to continue for another month or so before it broke out. And so that's why I took Amazon is because I had a more confirmed idea of the price range that where Amazon could end up, which is why I could take a calendar cost spread on it with confidence. 
And then when we broke up above the trend, I was like, usually what happens when we break above a trend is we go back and we retest that trend line. So I was like, I'm still okay holding these. Plus, based on the calendar, you know, the profit and loss, I'm still okay. Like, even if it goes up. I think my range on my 3400C actually went all the way up to about 3700 and it went down to like 3160 which is almost the bottom of this triangle. And that's why I took that play, because I was like, even if it has a major beat, you know, 3700 that's that's above all-time highs at, um, you know, where was it, 3500 ish So I was like, We're, I'm going to be in the money, pretty much guaranteed. Uh, and then if we drop, I expect that this area to hold us support, and it's unlikely we drop all the way down here. So that's why I took that play. Uh, but basically, that's how I assess these plays with Twitter. Uh, unfortunately, I'm I'm not really that sure, not that confident about it. Uh, I do think that you know we're going to retrace back to this bottom trend line here for a touch. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen with ER or after or before, but I feel like that's a strong possibility of that happening there. Uh, I think all of these major drops here that brought it back down in this trend line were related to news-related items. So ER might actually be a catalyst for that. Um, but, you know, who knows? Uh, just guessing here. So for calendar ER plays, I take them only when I have very high probability of success. Um, for that, I think for the Amazon and Pins play, it was like above 90%, actually, chance of profit. Uh, so I hope that answered and clarified some questions about calendar call spreads and options that we talked about today. Um, you know, the tools I, I use to find these things and the calculator, how to use it. Uh, just play around with different ERs and stuff and see if you can find something with a good skew. The higher the skew, the better, right? Because so, if this IV skew was higher, we, we would be more profitable, right? So you increase the IV. Um, and, and usually you would hope that this IV difference is increasing as well and not just the average IV, which is what this is right now. But yeah, just try to find those good, good risk reward plays, uh, chart it to figure out what your expected price range is based on chart patterns. So if you, it breaks out, where do you think it could go? If it breaks down, where can it go? Does your profit and loss analysis match up with that? Is it a high probability play? Uh, don't go all in on any of these plays because with ER, anything can happen. Um, you know, with pins, I, I think I took 50 um, total. And, you know, for me, that's not a big size, right? But, um, you know, that's about half of my usual size. So, you know, with ER, anything can still happen, even if your, you're, you know, your prob probabilities are with you and highly likely to be successful, you should still always make sure to size in appropriately. Um, and if you do that over time with multiple ER plays, eventually you're going to be rolling consistently that kind of ER profit in. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Twitter could still be a decent play though. But um, yeah, this plan just makes me not sure. Any questions? Guys, I have to read the chat to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Been ignoring you guys in chat for a while. Uh... Let me scroll up. Yep, uh, Disco King uh, for patterns. Longer time frame patterns always hold up better than short time frame patterns, and the bigger pattern is more likely to play out than the short term frame pattern. If you're playing on a, for example, 15 minute chart, you should expect your move to happen, you know, within 10, 15 candles or something like that, right? If you're playing on a daily chart, you're expecting, you know, one, two weeks out for your pattern to fully play out, stuff like that. Uh, you know, with every time frame, we're looking at a different time frame for your play. So, but um, yeah, longer time frame patterns are always going to be better and more robust than your short time frame patterns. Uh, option calculator, yeah, I'll, I'll put that link in. Uh, one other thing I really like about option strat is that you can save your trade, right? So I can, I can give this a name and be like Twitter ER calendar play to 
uh, I think it was on the ninth, right? And that can be like, uh, I don't know, IV crush or something. Has some downside risk, right? Because because I don't know if it's gonna go back and retrace down to this wedge, right? And that makes this play not profitable. Right, and then it gives you a link, and then you can share it with people, right? So, um, go here. So that's uh, that's a link to my play, essentially. Um, and then the best part is that if you create an account, uh, I don't remember what my account details are right now, but um, but basically if you log in to your account, it will have all these saved trades in your profile once you click into it, and it will track it throughout the duration of that play. So even if you and you're just theory crafting, theory testing, you can just put in that play, uh, go back to here, right? You can save that trade on your account, and then you can refer back to it anytime and be like, um, you can see if it was profitable or not, how much it lost, what percent it was, etc. So I think it's a really useful tool if you're doesn't matter what your experience level with options are, it it's um helpful for you to be able to test out new strategies or even test out um, you know, old and tried and true strategies just to back test and theory test uh, to see if a certain type of play works out as you expected, um, without having to risk, you know, your money on the line. Of course, you can also paper trade. That works just as well. But I think this is really convenient because you can just save that trade here. Um, you don't have to worry about going to your broker or your program or whatever and uh, entering in those trades on a paper account. You can just see the profit and loss here uh, and it tracks it in your saved account. So useful tool. Uh, definitely check them out. Um, I'm not paid by them, by the way. <laughs> They do have, uh, they will have a sub soon. And that's just because their data right now is currently delayed by 15 minutes. Again, not applicable if you're doing research after hours, right? So the other website I want you guys to remember is barchart.com here. Useful tool for researching those IV differences or just options in general. Like, hey, what's the most op active options is change in open interest. Open interest is how many people are still holding certain contracts um, at the end of the day. And if there's a lot of volume on that, that means there's a lot of interest in it, right? That's why it's called open interest. Uh, but yeah, you can see uh, pretty much everything here. Unusual options activity. I use this tool a lot, again, to find good options to play. If there's a lot of activity in a certain call, basically what it does is it does volume divided by open interest because it shows that there's an increase in people trading a certain uh, certain options contract in a certain ticker. Then, you know, usually maybe there's there's something going on with a certain ticker and it's worth taking a look at. So I use this to help me identify possible tickers to look at to play. And then I chart it out, see if I agree with this possible idea. And then if I do agree with it, I'll follow them. You know, that's uh, how I use that. So I'm going to link that as well, barchart.com. And guys, if you aren't in Xtrades already, uh, be sure to join us. Um, we do have a free trial. I th believe it's 20 days. Great community. I basically learned how to trade from start to finish with Xtrades. Uh, again, I've been trading for about seven years and uh, with Xtrades for about five. And so, you know, uh, a lot of what I've learned over time has been with this community, right? It's a great community just to bounce ideas off of and to learn and to grow together. So um, hope this video helps. Uh, yes, this is near the end of the seminar. So unless anybody has any questions, going back to these slides here, yep. So thanks for attending our first lesson in our options trading strategies trading course. Uh, if you guys have any questions, just put it in the chat or anything you want me to take a look at. Uh, session will be every every two weeks is what I'm planning. 
uh, because it does take some time for me to basically prepare the material, right? Um, yeah, I'll I'll just be going through different strategies every single time we go through one of these seminars, uh, and then I'll be probably be going over iron condors and maybe some bull and put spreads next time. Um, so thinking about it, if you guys have any thing that like particular strategies that you'd like to see uh and want to know how i use them or when it's a good time to use them you know just dm me and we can take a look at those for next time um but yeah what broker are you using to trade with mvp empire um so i use tastyworks for my options strategies um One second. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, I use Tastyworks as my primary options broker. I also use uh, Robinhood and Webull, like most folks probably do, uh, because you know it's "quote unquote" free. It does come of a cost, though, um, mind you. But yeah, I do like to use Tastyworks for their options, and they have good fills. Uh, their platform is pretty good, and you can see they they show you a lot of the uh, numbers and stuff when you take your options. And they give you like, it, they basically show you this kind of stuff without having to use an options probably calculator. Um, I don't know if I can find some images or something, but this is what it looks like. So for example, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, I should probably open up the image, right? So basically you have your, uh, the same thing. You can open up a, a, a spread or a butterfly in this case. Uh, and it tells you, you know, your max profit, your max loss, where are you green, where are you red. Um, but yeah, it tells you the IV percent, exp um, things like that. But I like Tastyworks. I've, I always find that I have better fills on them than when I use, say, Robinhood. Uh, it does charge commissions. Uh, I think it's 65 cents, if I recall correctly. Uh, but yeah, I, I do use Tastyworks for most of my options trading, and then I use a lot of Robinhood and Webull as well. So let's see. Yep. Uh, thanks for joining us, 3Day. We'll see you next time. When is the next session? Oh, I think we answered that already. I'm going back now, huh? Uh, let's see. Welcome back, 007. Do you hold long-term positions or always on the move? Uh, I do hold long-term positions. I, I have some, um, mostly those are equities, but I do have some leap calls as well. Uh, but for purposes of, I guess, trading, you know, it's always going to be on the move, right? I'm always looking for the quick profit plays, essentially. So like ER plays. I'm only holding it for one day for those calendar plays that we talked about today, uh, things like that. Um, but I have most of my portfolio in long-term positions. I think I only traded with about, this is just roughly about 20% of my account. Uh, that's rough estimate there. Is there a lower bound for volume and open interest where you would not enter a strike because of illiquidity or no liquidity? Uh, or fear you can't get out yes uh i basically usually when i take a play i mean when you see the spread is really wide that just means that it probably isn't very liquid um so usually i don't take those plays because the risk and reward benefits changes greatly if your spread is like for example two dollars wide or something you'll see that a lot with like a lot of the bigger tickers too and that's just because they're so you know they move a lot like tesla or something like you see a really really wide fit. Um, 
But if you trade something like Spy, you'll notice that it has like basically a one cent width. So you basically you can get in at the price it currently is marked at. Um, and I think that's really important when you take your options. So volume is important. Uh, open interest is important. I don't know if there's a lower bound to it, but if I notice that my spread is too wide as a result, then I'm not going to take the play. Uh, and this is also usually why I prefer playing like larger cap tickers instead of um, smaller tickers, because usually those have more volume on them. This is like looking inside a photo of a photo of a photo. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I think I still need to figure out how to properly set up this streaming so that I'm not like showing you guys everything, I think. I think you can change that, but I'm not really sure how to. <laughs> I'll do better next time with Twitch, guys. <laughs> Sorry for uh, all the delays today, too. Yep, uh, vicious shots. How big of a position? Young Bull answered. It. He said five percent or less of your total account size. That's that's reasonable. Uh, you know, it totally depends on your own account size and how much risk you want to take. Um, but yeah, smaller smaller sizing is better. I think definitely no more than twenty percent of your account. And at that point, it's it's a lot, right? But I know some people have like really small accounts. In that case, that's when I recommend you to take more spread type of plays instead of like just naked calls or puts, because that can reduce the cost of your plays. Um, yeah. Does it help to get around PDD having multiple accounts? Yes. The more accounts you have, the more day trades you have. But to be honest, I actually intentionally uh, trade under twenty five k because it makes me trade less on each of my accounts. So the only account I have more than 25K on is actually my long-term account. And the reason for that is because I find that if I have the ability to day trade, I, at least when I first started, I over-traded. And uh, even though I had like massive gains on one day, say like I went from, you know, 10K to 25 or 30K in, in like one or two days, and then suddenly the next few days i find myself back down at like 18k or something you know i give it all back up when i when i trade too much so that's why i uh, prefer keeping my trading accounts below that level so that i'm not uh over trading yes uh for finding stocks to look at um, again, newsbarchart.com. I use that a lot to basically scan for things that are moving. Uh, and if those pop up on my radar, then I go and take a look at it on the charts and see if it's worth a play. I also have my own personal watch list of stocks that I really like to trade that I kind of have a grasp of the general movement for. Uh, one example that is Chewy. I trade that a lot. It's probably my first or second most alerted um, ticker in X trades. And it's just because I've done it, I've traded it so many times that I have a better grasp of how it usually moves. So it's uh, more likely to be profitable for me. So once you find your ticker that you really like to trade, stick with it, you know? And then of course, use a scanner to find those other tickers occasionally when you um, want to play something else or tickers you normally look at aren't showing good setups. So that's what I would do. For Twitter, if I am bearish, is there a difference in selling 65C or buying 50P if you're bearish on it? Let's see. And thanks, guys, for all, all your comments and stuff. Um, happy to be here for you guys and help out. Let's take a look at this Twitter, okay? So if you're bearish on it. So basically, you're saying that you expect Twitter to drop, right? Oh, here it is. So let's open that up here. Uh, you were saying 50... Oh, wait. 
selling 65C or buying 50B? Well, if you sell 65C, it would mean that you're bullish, right? Because remember, a calendar call spread is actually a net bullish position. The only difference is uh, you can treat it as basically you're buying a discounted longer call. So I'm buying 65C219. I'm, I'm bull on Twitter, basically, right? At that point, if I buy that. And I'm selling the, the shorter dated contract to give me a discount on buying this one. That's basically what that is. Um, so it's a cheaper way to play the bull side while expecting the stock to remain relatively flat or only move up a little bit, right? Up to the strike price. You want it to expire at 65. So uh, 65 would actually be pretty bullish. Uh, and then looking at the calendar put spread. Did you say, what was that, 60p or 50p? Let me change the dates here. So yeah, I mean, if you're taking the put spreads, that means that you're basically, you're essentially, your base sentiment is bearish on a play, but you have a neutral bearish stance. Whereas a calendar call spread that is above, you know, out of the money, above, above the current price, has a net bullish position. So if you're net bearish and you take a calendar put spread with a strike below the current price, that means you're a net bear on Twitter, but you're expecting some neutrality, right? You're expecting some neutrality. And like you're like, maybe it might rise a little bit, but not too much. So if you're bearish on Twitter, getting a calendar uh, put spread is actually a really good idea. So at this chart here, if I expect this to act as resistance, right, on this chart pattern, this rising wedge. And I expect it to go down to 47, okay? And um, it doesn't, I don't know, blow up out of this plot pattern for some reason. This post spread will be a great play because that gives you leeway. For example, up here is my resistance, right? I don't expect it to go any higher than 60 immediately. Unless they have a blowout earnings, I don't know. Never know, right? But then it can go all the way down to 46. Then over here, if you see, your break even for um, on the bull side is actually above that point. You have some leeway all the way up to about $64 by expiration. Chances are you're not going to hold it all the way to expiration. You probably take profits uh, to, or sorry, not Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, right? Uh, because at that point, you've already gained most of your value. And you don't really want to hold for additional risk of having it move too far out of your range. So this is actually a great play if you are bearish on Twitter. As opposed to this, which is super bullish, comparatively, right? Both patterns, or sorry, both strategies are neutral. We, we would prefer it to be close to our strike. Uh, I think you're looking at 50, actually. I, I would do something like a little bit. When, when I take um, ER plays, I prefer only having a little bit out of the money because I, I expect the price to move, but I expect it to move from here. So my expected move from all the previous ERs that we looked at, you know, maybe you might get a $10, $15 move at most, right? So it'll be from that point. So the closer I am uh, to being the current price of it with my strikes, the more leeway I have on that range to get me to where I want. So yeah, if you're bearish on it, I think a 55P could be good for Twitter. Um, and it gives you some range up to this uh, major resistance point, right? From 2015 or, or whatever it was, uh, 2014. So you, you would expect that this to act as resistance. Because we see here that this peak right here acted as resistance once here, and that's when it rejected back down in this rising wedge. We see here the peak too, all same thing. We reject it down here, right? If you notice that every single time it's hit these peaks, it's made a major correction. So peak three, even if we hit this 58.86, I think there's a pretty good chance that it was it's gonna have a sharp reaction back down. So yeah, I think I think um, you know, this calendar put spread could be a pretty good idea if you are bearish on Twitter. And it matches up with what the chart's projecting right now. So might be a good play. Uh personally myself, I prefer playing long side, and that's just my general 
market bias, uh, and that's just because you know markets markets go up, right? Um, so I usually prefer playing call side rather than put side. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, Yeah, don't bet the whole house on alerts, guys. Uh, and and if you're playing on the markets, make sure that it's money that you don't need. Uh, if you're trading to, quote unquote, make a living or something and uh, make ends meet, usually you're going to be trading emotionally and you won't be able to uh, be as profitable if you had a more clear mind with playing with money that basically doesn't matter if you lose or not, right? So you can just trust the analysis and trust the system. Put spread seem risky on a rising wedge play. It could dip before 212 and bounce up before 219. You have to take profits to the bottom of the channel prior to the bounce. Yep, that's correct. Uh, yeah. So you, you'd be betting that, you know, back on Twitter again, before 219, that we re retrace back to the bottom of the channel, which is very possible, right? Uh, so that's the advantage of playing a ER play early on in the week is that even if it moves against you, or out, out of your range. If you see something on your chart that tells you that it could possibly pull back, you can you have some time to let it drift back closer to your strike price, and then you can close your play. And then you will win uh, from that premium collection as well as being close to the strike, right? Okay. Any other questions from you guys? If not, I'm ready to <laughs> close out for today. Uh, and also, guys, uh, make sure you vote on um, vote for the weekend report tickers ticker analysis. Uh, I I only had like fourteen or fifteen votes when I checked uh, last night or this morning, like midnight. I think a lot of people like missed missed the post because I usually get like over a hundred. <laughs> All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll be back probably in about two weeks for another seminar session. I'm considering doing doing alternate uh, weeks of either having a session and then maybe just like a play review slash charting on the weekends. Um, but yeah, for now, just expect the next stream from me, uh, Timehawk, to be in about two weeks from now. But, you know, 007 is here every day of the week. <laughs> He's doing ERs every day. So, you know, come and tune in for his streams as well. He's really helpful. And, um, you know, he's probably one of the traders I look up to. He's really good at charting, and he's always ready to explain things. Definitely check him out, too. Uh, nope, I am from the West Coast. All right, enjoy your weekend, guys, and enjoy the Super Bowl. Until next time. Oh, yep, I'll plug in the link to vote one second here. Nobody has that up already because uh, I don't have anything pulled up right now. Gonna pull up that voting link real quick. All right, that's the link to vote for the uh, weekend report. So if you're part of our Discord, uh, you know every week I post up um, a weekly report. Basically, I 
what I expect of the market conditions. I analyze uh, S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, a little bit of Dow Jones. I look at a few different indicators. I think what is going to happen and why I feel the way I feel. Um, you know, just my opinion, really. And then I I go through some tickers and chart analysis, technical and fundamental analysis for a few tickers that you guys vote on. So if you guys want to see that, join our Discord and also uh, vote on this forum. So yeah, guys, any tickers you want to look at, put them up. All right. Have a good weekend, guys. And thanks for coming again.